All right, Steve, take it away. The chair notes the time is 6.01. I call this meeting of the Amherst Voting Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. And as EBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of the ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Everald Hemmer Henry. Present. Mr. Philip White. Present. Ms. Sarah Marshall. Present. Mr. David Sloviter. Present. The quorum is present. Also attending the meeting tonight is Mr. Rob Mora, Building Commissioner, and Mr. Rob Wachilla, Planner for the Town. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021, extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 40A of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority with the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and the ZBA webpage. The procedure is as follows. The petitioner presents the application to the board during the public hearing, after which the board will ask questions for clarification or additional information. After the board has completed its questions, the board will seek public input. This public, the public speaks with the permission of the chair. If a member of the public wishes to speak, they should so indicate by using the raised hand function on their screen or by pressing pound nine on their phone. The chair with the assistance of the staff will call upon people wish wishing to speak. When you are recognized, provide your name and address for the board for the record. All questions and comments must be addressed to the board. The board will normally hold public hearings where information about a project and input from the public is gathered, followed by public meetings for each. The public meeting portion is where the board deliberates and is generally not an opportunity for public comment. If the board feels it has enough information and time, it will decide upon the applications tonight. Each petition heard by the board is distinct and evaluated on its own merits, and the board is not ruled by precedent. Statutorily for a special permit, the board has 90 days from the close of the hearing to file a decision. For a variance, the board has 100 days from the date of filing to file its decision. No decision is final until the written decision is signed by the sitting board members and is filed by the town clerk's office or filed in the town clerk's office. Once the decision is filed with the town clerk, there's a 20 day appeal period for an aggrieved party to contest the decision with the relevant judicial body in Superior Court. After the appeal period, the permit must be recorded at the Registry of Deeds to take effect. Tonight's agenda, consideration of minutes from September 28th, 2023 and October 12th, 2023 public hearings. ZBA FY 2024-04, Charles, Dana, and Roki Zong request for a special permit under 3.3211 of the Zoning Bylaw to convert an existing owner-occupied duplex structure into a non-owner occupied duplex with two rental units, five bedrooms in total at 62 Taylor Street, map 14B, parcel 74, RG, general residence zoning district. This is continued from our October 12th, 2023 meeting. ZBA FY 2024-05, Jai Fuller Enterprises Inc. request for a special permit under section 10.33 of the zoning bylaw to modify ZBA FY 2018-04 to reflect a change in the property management and incorporate an updated management plan in accordance with conditions three and five at 320 West Street, map 20A, parcel 103, RN, Neighborhood Residence Zoning District. And ZBA FY 2024-06, Priscilla White, request for a public, for a special permit under sections 3.3241 and 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to change the use of an existing family, single family residence with attached ADU into a converted dwelling with two units, five bedrooms total 
at 318 Lincoln Avenue, map 11C, parcel 55, RG, General Residence Zoning District. Following the public hearing and public meetings, there'll be a general public comment period on, on matters not before the board tonight, other business not anticipated within 48 hours, and a motion to adjourn. Are there any disclosures by ZBA members uh, regarding the agenda tonight? Ms. Marshall. Yes, I was not present at the first hearing on, on the 2024-04 uh, matter um, on October 12th, but I have watched the recording of that meeting and filed the affidavit. Great, thank you. First order of business tonight is minutes from September 28th. I reviewed those minutes myself. Um, I thought they were accurate and complete. Does anybody have any additions, corrections, or comments about the minutes of the September 28th meeting? If not, I would entertain a motion to approve the minutes for September 28th. Do I have a motion? So move. Is there a second? Aye. It's been moved and seconded. Is there any discussion regarding the motion? If not, we'll vote on the motion to approve the um, minutes. And let's keep the panel for the first panel, the first um, matter before us um, as the, uh, the group to decide the, the minutes. So if there's no other objections, we'll vote on a roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? No, I mean, um, Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Motion carries for nothing. The minutes are approved. The next order of business is the minutes of October the 12th meeting. <clears throat> um, I've reviewed those as well. I think they're uh, accurate and complete. Are there any suggestions, Ms. Marshall? Yes. Um, <clears throat> Every, there were only four um, people on the panel. So every time there is a motion, I think the proper way uh, to write is just 4-0-0. The person who's absent is not counted in the vote. Depends on how the board wants that. <laughs> I mean, if, if everybody else agrees with Ms. Marshall, we can do it that way. Um, usually, the last point is the abstention, but I don't know if you would count an absence as an abstention as well in this situation. Um, but if not, I could definitely correct that to, to reflect a zero at the end. Yeah, I, I don't, I don't, well. <laughs> you, can, you obviously I, do I don't care. think it's proper. <laughs> I'm sorry? I mean, you, it's something you do care about. You, ra you raised it. So, um, you know, I, it's an abstention, which is different than absent. Um, there were only four votes. There was not somebody who said they were absent. So I think you're probably right. Okay. Yep. So, so there are several motions. Yeah. So we'll just... recorded. So everywhere it, uh, occurs. Yeah. And then just one one spelling change. Uh, the ZBA FY 2024-04. Um, the 62 Taylor Street. Mm -hmm. In the second bullet, it starts the applicants. The first bullet under that, mm -hmm. the applicants are prospective buyers, not Correct. perspective. Yeah. Could you um specify the page that's on, please? Sorry, page four. Page four. Page four. Okay. That's a good catch. Thank you. Yeah, that's all. All right. Any other comments, questions? Thanks. If not, um, any further discussion? We'd entertain a motion to approve the uh, minutes of the September, of the October 12th meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Do I have a second? Aye. If there's no further discussion, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the minutes. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Aye. So the minutes as amended are approved um, and we proceed to the first special permit application. 
ZBA FY 2024-04, Charles Dana and Roki Zong request for a special permit under section 3.3211 of the zoning bylaw to convert an existing owner-occupied duplex structure into a non-owner-occupied duplex with two rental units, five bedrooms in total, at 62 Taylor Street, map 14D, parcel 74, RG, General Residence Zoning District, continued from 10-12-2023. The panel for this matter includes myself, Mr. Henry, Mr. White, Mr. Marshall, and Mr. Slobiter. Um, submissions for this since our last meeting include a uh, new management plan updated the 11th of the 2nd of, uh, of November, a new complaint response form updated the 2nd of November, a project narrative updated the 2nd of November, um, floor plans updated the 2nd of November, lighting plan and landscape plan also both updated the 2nd of November. Um, the correction in the, the um, site visit narrative that it occurred on October 10th and changes to reflect the desire to have six rather than five um, bedrooms that carries throughout the application. I think that's it. Do we have, and we have a staff, a staff submission is old. Did we have any public comment on this? Rob, we didn't have any submitted, I don't think. No public comments for this specific hearing item. Um, and then I mentioned the updated those documents that you just announced. Um, and that's pretty much it, Mr. Chairman. All right. Um, do we have the applicants? So actually, I think Ms. Marshall had um, her hand up. I don't know if yeah, you want I, to. I just wondered whether, whether the um, diagrams or maps that Mr. Wachilla sent out late this afternoon oh, yes. are included oh, in that. Yeah, you might want yeah. to mention that. <laughs> yeah, we have, we have maps of the um, sent to us from the staff um, on 62 Taylor Street showing owner occupied buildings, non owner occupied buildings, single family residents, and two family residences within a hundred within a thousand feet of the subject property. All right. Um, so Mr. Chip Dana, who is joining as a panelist, I believe is speaking on behalf of the petition before you for 6-2 Taylor Street. Uh, Chip, is there anybody else you want me to promote besides yourself to, to speak on behalf of your project or are you fine with just doing it by yourself? Um, I think for the most part, it's gonna be us. I don't know okay. if um, Angela is here, uh, if she might have something to chime in. Okay. Just give us your names and address for the record, please. I'm Chip Dana. I live at uh, Four Still Corner Road in Leverett, Massachusetts. Uh, Ruo Chi Zhong, same address. Great. Go ahead. You may proceed. Yeah. So, um, again, thank you for taking the time to see us. Um, we are interested in acquiring this property. We've been um, kind of under contract for, what I don't know how many months, since at least August. Um, and one of the issues is trying to work out the, this permit. As I believe you are aware, um, the current owner, I guess it was originally an owner occupied and didn't realize the, the previous permit that allowed for a non-owner occupied status had lapsed. And so we're trying to, to rectify that um, and get it back in a cool move. Um, so our interest in this property is that you know, we, we moved to the area here about a year ago um, and are looking forward to, to, to spending a long time here. And as a result of that, we you know, invested in our property in Chicago and um, are looking to invest here primarily because we want to be close to our property that um, we're, we're looking after. And so we've, we've, um, looked at this property because we live about 10 minutes away. We both work about 10 minutes away um, and are looking to be be good stewards. Um, both of us, I have a background in architecture. My wife, Rosie, is an architect here in town. And so we look at the property and want to make sure everything in it is uh, safe and um, kept in good, good order. We do plan to make some, some improvements to the property 
um, primarily structural things that um, are not required, but are just things that would make us feel a little bit uh, better about it in terms of settling and stuff. Um, the, what else? Um, yeah, this is like a same as our only investment property um, in, in the area. So we're, we're, we're just looking to, to try and be good stewards and, and maintain this uh, property in its best condition. Um, as it was mentioned, we, we updated a lot of plans in accordance to the, the panel comment, the, the board's comments in the last meeting. And we can either walk through those or answer your questions directly that you might have. I think it's most valuable for you to walk through your plans and then we can ask the questions all at, the, in, at one time. Sure. Uh, Jim, the board, you, yes? you are able to screen share if you have any documents you want to present to the board. Okay. Give me one second here. Uh, uh, then you can change it to just just this one gives me sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just let me know if you can see the uh, plans. Yep. Mm -hmm. to us. Okay. So this here is the um, the basement floor plan. So we we updated the the floor plans. Um, you'll notice here that they do say the sizes and dimensions are approximate. The we contemplating going out there and doing exact measurements, but it, with the time constraints, wasn't going to be uh, feasible. So we we used uh, kind of one of those practices that the realtors use uh, to generate the floor plans, and this should be accurate within a couple of inches. So we're we're looking at really highly accurate, but not something I would actually build from or to use to to make modifications. So um, what you're looking at here is the basement floor plan. So this is a fieldstone foundation. Um, and unfinished space and the two squares and it represent the two boilers that are downstairs um, that are in good working condition. The here's we move to the first floor plan. Um, the primary entrance for the first floor unit is off of the deck that's on the side of the house, um, which takes you into the kitchen. Um, off of the, the kitchen, you can travel to your left into the main living room, family space. And off of that are the two bedrooms that are associated with this unit. Um, you can also access the common stair labeled here as the foyer. Um, you know, it's the original foyer of the house, but now acts as primarily a second means of egress for both units. Um, that is used sometimes, but it is kind of like I said, a, a more of a second entrance, right? Now. Um, if you go back to the kitchen, you can go out of the kitchen into a small hall. I believe this used to be maybe a rear stair. I'm not sure exactly. It's kind of a, a little bit of a funny space. Um, and we've labeled it as a bonus room. It's you know, mostly a storage space. And then off of that is the bathroom for this unit. Um, if you go back outside, you can see in the rear of the house, there is an unfinished storage space as well. Uh, and that's where you access the, the basement yeah, space. That's how you access the, down to the basement. Um, if we travel now to the second floor, this uh, unit is primarily accessed off of a deck on the other side of the property, um, accessed from the rear of the property. Um, that also takes you up into the kitchen off of this kitchen um, directly you have the bathroom to your left and then one of the bedrooms on this floor and you come kind of similar to the other unit you, you enter into a main living space that has the two other bedrooms on this floor as well as access to this common hall um, or second means of egress for the unit um, and traveling back to the kitchen there is a doorway that leads up the stair to this loft um, space, which um, based on everything we understand is a legal, meets the legal definitions of a bedroom. Um, and that's why we want to count this as a bedroom. It originally was, I believe. Um, at one point it was counted as a bedroom. The, uh, there's also a property card. I believe you can see this. Can you see the, the property card currently? Yep. Um, 
that identifies it as a six bedroom house. Um, but going back here, it's unclear why exactly there's a note that says that it's not a, to be used as a bedroom. Um, like I said, it, it meets the requirements of a bedroom. So um, this is the reason why we're saying it's a, a six bedroom as opposed to a, uh, a five bedroom house, uh, as was mentioned in the, the previous zoning board meeting. I may ask one question before you move on to something else. Yep. So I, I think when we were last here, you were going to get clarification from the town if it was quote unquote bedroom okay. Was that done? So we did inquire about this um, and we didn't, you know, and, and nobody said that we needed to, uh, to, to follow up with that on our end. Um, as I said, from our standpoint, our understanding that meets the requirements of a bedroom. Um, it has the full window here. It has the appropriate, appropriate amount of uh, headspace, living space. Um, and just to chime in, and Rob Moore, feel free to jump into it at some point. So at the last meeting, we kind of established that it meets local or meets building code standards in terms of being a bedroom. So it's technically connected to the second floor. So the second and third floor are the same unit. And since the second floor has two points of egress, the third story doesn't need a second point of egress. And therefore, it's considered a it can be considered a legal bedroom if, if it was treated as such. So Rob Moore does have his hand up and he can definitely chime in if he wants to. Mr. Mora. Yeah, I agree with everything that's been said. I would just suggest that if the board were to grant this permit, a condition that would allow us to confirm that no additional work is needed to make that a sleeping room. Um, although all the things that have been said sound great. Uh, you know, we do want to uh, do conduct an inspection. We haven't been asked to look at that in detail. Um, you know, smoke detector, carbon monoxide detector, window size and ceiling height. Those are the basic requirements. Um, you know, but we want, we just want to make sure those are all, um, you know, in place or make sure that they get put in place before it's used. What's the ceiling height requirement, Rob, for um, a bedroom? It's seven foot zero up up there, seven feet high. And, and and then there's very there's specific requirements for the opening size of the window, uh, and then to make sure that there's a carbon monoxide detector and a smoke detector up there that's interconnected with the rest of the house is uh, very important. Yeah, and Mr. Dana, what is the height of your ceiling? You know. Uh, it's about eight foot here in the middle, but it does have um, more of a cathedral ceiling. So this dash line represents where it becomes a five foot ceiling and would be considered livable space. Um, and so the average should be above the seven foot for the space. Mr. Chair, uh, Ms. Marshall does have her hand up. Ms. Marshall? Yeah, I assume this is uh, otherwise that the attic space of the house. So is it heated? <laughs> Hope it's heated. Yes. Thank you. Is it finished? Yes. And so there's insulation and underneath the drywall or whatever the finishing material is that you know. Yes. Of? Yeah. Yeah. We, we we believe so. The last we were there was August. Um, so it's been quite a while, but um, we were actually surprised that without a window air conditioning unit that it was actually relatively cool with the ventilation, the, the skylights open up. Um, so it allows for, for ventilation. Um, it seems like a nice space. Okay. All right. Um, you know, I'll just, I will show you a picture of it, but uh, the pictures have tenants belongings. And so uh, I didn't feel comfortable sharing that without their permission. So it's used currently for storage. Uh, it's used for some living space. I don't know if it's currently how it's currently being used since we haven't been there since August. But they had the chair and, and other belongings in there, which is permissible. But it wasn't a sleeping unit. It wasn't a sleeping room at the time. It was at one time. The first, but not 
when you observed it because but, it wasn't allowed under the special the previous special permit. Right, and as was mentioned in the, the last meeting, the current owners have requested that the tenants not use that as a uh, bedroom. Okay. All right, um, you can continue with your presentation. Sure. Um, I'll jump to the parking plan here next. Um, I hope you can see this all right. I'll maybe zoom in a little bit. Um, so the um, primary house located here um, shares a driveway with the neighboring property. I believe it's 70 Taylor Street. Um, it's a, a gravel driveway. Um, and it is primarily on 62 Taylor Street, but a portion of it is on the, the neighbor's property and then provides the access to um, where they park, which I would say is typically where I've observed them park is partially on 62 Taylor Street. Um, and uh, that gravel driveway on 62 Taylor Street extends back to the rear of the property where there should be, or you can fit three cars. It was noted before, it's a bit tight. Um, we did consider looking at this in different configurations that may allow for more, either more comfortable parking or even four parking spaces. Um, however, that would require paving most of the backyard, which we're not big fans of. Um, this does seem to be working properly in its current configuration. Um, we also did have a, a great conversation with the neighbor at 70 um, Taylor Street. Uh, she actually strongly feels that this should remain a gravel driveway. She's lived there for 50 years and, and said that uh, she hasn't had issues with it. The one issue they had was when a water pipe burst in 62 Taylor Street and washed out a little portion of it, which they've obviously since repaired. Um, so, um, essentially we're looking at leaving it in existing conditions. Um, part of our, uh, maintenance plan for the parking is that we're going to limit the, uh, not amount of guest parking that can occur on, uh, Taylor street, uh, to, I, can't, I don't have the numbers right off the top of my head, but, um, I think it's in the management plan here. Um, I just want to make sure I get the verbiage correctly. So, you know, we're going to allow for um, two guests to park on the street in accordance with the regulations of the town for up to three hours and not to exceed twice a week. Um, and then additional guest parking is to be referred to the metered parking either on Main Street, which would be uh, kind of in front of the, the um, is it Emily Dickinson uh, house? Uh, or uh, another public parking place in, in town center. Um, so we're trying to, to minimize the, the impact to any uh, on-street parking that may occur. Mr. Chair, I have a quick question regarding parking, if that's okay, if I may yeah. ask it. Um, so I guess one thing I was, uh, when I was doing the initial review of, of the plans beforehand, it was hard to determine whether or not the closest parking space was greater than eight feet away from the building. Can you confirm that that's the case? Just because zoning requires that it has to be at least eight feet away from the closest building structure, which in this case would be the house. I would say it's, it's yeah. feasible. It's definitely, yeah, it, these spaces that are shown are nine foot by 18 by feet. Yeah. Drawn to uh, scale. So a and, and drawn to scale. So this is, if you imagine one of these spaces, it's nine feet wide and look at to the corner of it, it's right in that neighborhood. Okay, thank you. And they could probably be pushed a little bit further towards the, the property line. Um, one more note that I would like to add is that the, um, you know, there's some mention outside of the meeting about uh, the potential for headlights shining on neighboring properties. And what we tempted to show here is that there's nothing directly uh, behind this house and behind this parking areas. In fact, if we were to zoom out further, you don't see anything for a very long distance until I think it's somebody's, uh, it's like an old coach house or, or something, and there's no windows on uh, facing this direction. Um, 
However, we are proposing to add some vegetation along here that has evergreen leaves to, um, you know, minimize headlight disruption, even if you're in a house on, um, this is Clay Street, over here, um, you might not want to see those headlights shining in your backyard. It might be distracting. So we're proposing adding some vegetation, uh, which we'll discuss in the landscape plan. Um, are there any questions about this part of it or should we move on? Mr. Soder has a question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, so ultimately you're proposing that there would be six bedrooms in this, correct? Correct. So if in future years, the six bedrooms included six vehicles, how would you, how would the tenants of this property accommodate six cars or even five cars? Yeah, uh, I, I guess we're we're not saying that it does. We're saying that it accommodates three, and that's what we would allow for. And and so th the additional two or three cars would need to be parked on Taylor Street, or I suppose somewhere in town where parking spaces could be secured. Yeah, we're we're only saying that you can have guest parking on Taylor Street. Um, Tenants, if they wish to have a vehicle, could have a vehicle somewhere else. So. Okay, but there's no provision to enforce that, or is there? Um, that's what we plan to enforce. I don't know. Uh, we can incorporate that into the lease. Well, I mean, do you think it's practical to expect that um, a tenant could be told that they can rent in the property, but they can't have a car. I don't even know if that's legal. I mean, how would you how would you limit three cars to this property other than saying there's only three parking spaces? Um, yeah, that's something that we haven't had to deal with here. Uh, it's actually something we're very familiar with in Chicago. Um, but um, we're, we would assign uh, probably two spaces to the upper unit and one space to the lower unit. Um, I'm not aware of for a six bedroom, if the town has a requirement on the required number of parking spaces. Um, if it does, we can consider a, a four car configuration that essentially would turn those, those spaces um, behind the house here. So you would have one, two, three, four spaces here. It's too close to the building. That would be too close to the, this is a, a shed that's attached to the house. I don't know if that counts. It's not living space. Still a structure. Uh, still a structure. So I, I believe we can only fit the three spaces here regardless. Um, okay. I guess we could, actually what we said was three spaces here and then it would be there, but that would still be closer than the, so. Okay. Um, there's Thank also you. just a, sorry to, I just want to mention here that there's slope in the portion directly adjacent to the house that kind of prevents uh, parking in that area as well. Right. Okay. Thank you. Are you going to have a parking management plan of some uh, where you have stickers so you know who is allowed to park there and that I know you I think in your in your lease do you um, mention that if you're that the cars can be towed if they're not on the property. Can, anyway, how are you going to manage that? Included. Um, I'm not sure that we have that included currently, but we can make sure that's included. I'm not sure about enforcing via stickers or getting specially made stickers for, for this. Um, or a hanger or, or some way license it through license plate or some way. Yeah. So how, you, the question is, how would you know you drive past, you see three cars there? How do you know that that's the three cars that are supposed to be there? Well, we'll, we'll we can record the model and make the vehicle along with the license plate as part of the uh, lease requirement, which is what we did with our, our previous property in Chicago. Okay. And then Mr. the last, uh, just one, one quick question, uh, as yeah. long as we're asking questions on, on parking. So yeah, the, I, the limitations on off-street parking by guests to uh, three hours twice a week is that a it's, is that a town restriction or is that one that you intend to 
that's what we just we we are saying that we don't want to be contributing to um, excess traffic um, parking on Taylor Street. Um, we know that it can get full. Oftentimes there are available parking spots there, at least when we've driven by. Um, but um, we just don't want guest parking to be kind of monopolizing the, the available parking to residents in the neighborhood. And if those are not guests, but they are residents who park on the street, um, you don't have a restriction on them. They're, they can park there as well. Um, your lease. Again, we're, we're saying right? they have the three parking spaces to, to utilize. So, but you should. have, but you might have more than three cars. And so I was just wondering, how do you envision? They they could park in front of the on Taylor Street. Those, in addition to the three cars that are in the back, if there are other additional cars associated with the building, they could park on Taylor Street. We're not saying that. We're, we're saying that they would have to find someplace else. Oh, so you would, so both guests and residents beyond the three that are permitted on the property somehow would, would and you intend to enforce that or how would that be enforced? Well, we would enforce that um, and we live and work close by. Okay. Uh, any other questions on parking before we move on? Mr. Wachilla, you had your hand raised. Yeah, I was going to suggest um, there are parking permits. I don't know if, if it's this close to Taylor Street where you can get residential parking permits to street park um, in some areas. I know we have them for town center. I don't know how far away this is, but that's something that people could consider as an option. Also, um, we could incorporate having an effective management plan, Mr. Chair, into the conditions, if, if you want me to note that for later, um, if the board feels comfortable considering that as something that should be required. Yeah, we can discuss that when we discuss conditions. Okay. And, uh, sorry, go ahead. I just wanted to say okay. this is not too far from the high school and I know a lot of high school students park on the surrounding streets during the school day. So that's that's part of the demand. I don't think it's all uh, residential parking on the street. Go ahead, I Mr. did look up um, previously on the town's website if this had a uh, parking permit and I did not see any parking permit requirement for Taylor Street. All right, you can continue. All right, um, I'll jump over to the uh, lighting plan. Um, so a couple of things uh, we've planned to leave the, the lighting primarily as it is, as it seems uh, sufficient and is all downward facing uh, light fixtures. Um, there are a few notes I would like to make that um, the front uh, landscaping is is largely overgrown. Um, I have a background in landscape horticulture, and these plants probably should have never been planted there. Um, and so, in the the landscape plan, we have a notation to to prune these uh, back and potentially remove them. If we do remove it, we'll go through the permit process if it's required with the town. Um, but to open this up and allow some of the lighting from this front porch light. Uh, to illuminate the front steps and a uh, portion of the front drive, which um, the, the side of the porch will allow for light to, to go down this uh, towards the driveway. Um, we're going to put this light on an astrometric timer so that it will turn on at uh, uh, dusk and then uh, turn off at 10 p.m. Uh, the reason why we don't want it to be on too late is there is a bedroom uh, right next to it and um, this, as I mentioned, is being a uh, primarily a secondary egress. Um, uh, you know, primary that's a primary function as a secondary access point. That um, you know we're, we don't expect a lot of people approaching this at nighttime. Most people that are living in the unit are going to be using the entrances at the rear of the property. Um, those are, with the exception of this next fixture by the right port by the porch are on um, motion detectors. 
This one. This one up here, mm -hmm. which is right on the, the uh, under the porch and shines towards the parking area and towards down the driveway. Um, this is on a motion detector and will be always on. The other light right by the door is also going to be on an astrometric timer um, that can be overridden by the light switch when you're inside the house. Um, the little, there's a little existing uh, LED solar fixture that's right over the um, door to the outdoor storage shed that will come on. Again, it's motion activated. Um, that's not considered to be a primary uh, lighting feature. It's just something that exists currently um, and may help with probably also the existing trash receptacle storage, but we have a different plan for that. Um, moving to the, the rear corner, there is a uh, rather high mounted uh, floodlight, again, motion activated. Um, so as you pull into the parking area, that'll come on and provide adequate lighting uh, to the rear walkway. Um, for the upper unit, as you get to the stairs, there's another motion activated um, downward facing floodlights for the lighting the stairs and the rear deck by the door. Uh, again, those will always be on and um, able to, to light up when somebody comes home. Um, none of these appear to be facing any of the neighboring properties. Um, the, they're very much directed downwards. The, uh, I'm just going to quickly jump back to this so you can see there's this house is relatively close, but um, I don't have photometrics. I can't prove this, but I, I do not anticipate that the light from the fixture here is, is shining on this, this house in any direct man manner. Um, does anybody have any questions regarding the lighting plan? I will jump onto the uh, landscape plan. Uh, so uh, as I mentioned previously, there's these uh, shrubs in the front that are a bit overgrown for the space. And so we're planning to prune those or potentially remove this middle one. Um, there are two larger existing trees um, that we plan to, to keep. Uh, this this is an oak that is planted too close. To, we, we are going to do some pruning to this tree as well to limit up. It kind of currently um, impedes some traffic on the driveway and is, is on the house. So we're going to do uh, a little bit of work to get that pulled back. Um, there are existing plantings that we intend to keep or enhance that are around the foundation of the property all the way back to the back porch. Um, the walkways are currently just steppers, um, but seem to be adequate for the, the, the uh, pedestrians walking from the parking spaces. Um, there was a note about this arborvitae hedge over here, and this is actually one other thing about the parking that we had been floated that this might be considered a place to expand parking. I didn't mention this before, but um, this was actually planted as a requirement of the previous uh, permit for the non-owner uh, non non occupied status. Um, and we looked at uh, potentially what would happen if we did remove it. And there's a, about a four foot elevation change here. Um, and so that would um, require building a retaining wall, um, which I think gets to be uh, a bit excessive. And I believe this was put in um, to shield the parking from the neighbor here at 70 Taylor Street. Um, uh, though we'll talk about snow removal a little bit um, later in terms of the plan, the, the management plan for it, but uh, we are going to use the same uh, company that's been doing this for, I don't know how long, but a long time. Again, this was mentioned by the person who lives at 70 Taylor Street who um, likes the work that they've done. And so we believe that they stockpile their snow here and along the back of the property. Um, I know this is tricky when it gets to the parking. There's a little bit of a issue with how do you <laughs> stockpile snow. 
I, I just know that he's been able to do this. Um, and so I, I have not talked to this person yet as we're prospective owners, but um, we plan to, to keep their same management plan for how, how they've managed snow on the driveways. It seems to be um, pleasing the, the tenants and the uh, neighboring property that shares the driveway. Uh, currently, these garbage uh, bins are stored just around the corner from where we're showing, um, right here at the back of the property outside of the um, outdoor storage area. It is uh, slightly visible in this location from um, the street. Uh, there's kind of a, a little area between, um, you can see where my cursor is from around here where you can actually see all the way back uh, to this location. And we're we're just going to have uh, the tenants move those right around the corner, so they'll be completely screened from uh, the road. Um, are there any questions regarding the the landscape plan? Uh, I have one. I'm just unclear. You talked about the elevation change in the <clears throat> northeast. Um, which way does it go up? I mean, I don't know. Which, which part's higher than what other part? Sure, the um, parking spaces are higher than the neighbor's driveway. Oh, okay. Okay. Okay, that's what we have in terms of the, um, the updated plans. The uh, complaint response plan has primarily been updated to reflect our um, current information. I should have been that way before, but um, that was our mistake. The management plan have been updated. Um, I've gone through a lot of this already. Um, Mr. Dana, I mean, if, when you, if you do purchase this, you'll have to redo this complaint response form to be where you will become a property owner. You just have to move your, it won't be a lot of work, but. Yeah. Yeah, okay, just so you. We understand. Yep. Oops. Um, regarding the updated uh, management plans, I've gone through a lot of this already um, in terms of the trash. Um, we're going to be using the same uh, company that's currently doing the, the trash removal, which comes once a week. Um, and we're updating the location where it will be stored. Um, the parking we've discussed already, um, lighting we've gone through. Signage, there, there is no signage currently. Um, it was mentioned maybe to try and identify parking places, or I believe that's gonna impede snow removal or snow storage. Um, and I don't know that it's gonna do a lot. If, if we feel that signage is needed for that, that's something we can consider. Um, landscape maintenance, we've uh, largely covered. There's no site furnishings. Um, we will be doing some of the maintenance along with the, the current, um, property management company. I, you know, I have a background in landscape horticulture, so I actually want to make sure the weeds are pulled properly. Uh, One question uh, I have is, I was there today to look at the property because I didn't participate in the, in the site visit. I couldn't, I couldn't identify the house. Um, and maybe there is a, a number on the front, but it's hard to see. And one thing I, uh, you know, for safety reasons, fire or everything else. I think you need a better uh, house number. Yeah. You know, if that, that needs to be done, we can put that in the in your signage. Yeah, there, there, there is a house number, but it is hard to see um, because it's kind of a silver on white. Yeah, so I can, I can see it on the picture, but I, I, I didn't see it in person, so. Yeah, no, that's a good point. We can update that to be a, a black uh, text so it'll show up against the white background. And also, as I mentioned, we're going to be pruning these shrubs back, so it'll make it a lot more visible. Couldn't see it. So I believe that's everything. Um, if there's more questions, we're happy to answer. So I have a couple of questions and I'll open it up to board members. Um, what's what's your anticipated use of the basement? Is there a ceiling height? Is it a finished basement? What's what's the floor situation? What is it? No, it's um, unfinished. It's unfinished. The ceiling height is only about five foot eight or so. Um, the, the portion of it is dirt floor, a portion of it I believe is and poured concrete, um, not in great shape. Um, 
so we plan to, uh, that's where we do plan to do a little bit of work to, to kind of stabilize the foundation. Um, Are there any mechanicals down there? The boilers are down there. Yeah, the boilers, okay. Um, but you're not planning, that's not gonna be used for storage and the, will the tenants have access to it? Okay, no. Yeah. Um, and then on your lease, I looked at your lease. You have, I don't, I didn't see any kind of, or your, uh, a sample lease. Um, I didn't see anything on restrictions either on guests and the duration of stay or the total number of people that can be on the property. Um, typically that is something that we include in conditions if it's not part of the lease. So um, you're going to have to give some thought to what condition was you're comfortable with um, in terms of limitations on visitors and length of time, numbers of visitors and length of time, and number of total people at any one time on the, on the property. Sure. We're, that's something we're happy to entertain. We're not familiar with that. Uh, it wasn't something that we were required to do in Chicago, but we understand why that's important. It's, that's an, it's an important consideration in Amherst. Yeah. Um, those are my fundamental questions. Um, do other members of the board have questions? All right, uh, Mr. Sloviter. Unmute myself. I'm sorry, I neglected to unmute myself. Um, wait one moment. Just want to get sorry to hold you up. Um, <clears throat> yes, um, well, <clears throat> this is more in the form of a uh, a comment than a question. I have a few concerns about how this property will function, largely parking. But my biggest problem is with the proposed change in this application. While the application is straightforward with no modifications of any significance to the building or property itself, the, the simplicity of the application does not make an insignificant change that is good for the neighborhood. You're trying to change this to a non-owner occupied status. And that's my concern. I consider that to be a major change. The result will be simply an investment property in a residential neighborhood. So we have seen in so many cases in Amherst that a non-owner occupied property is much more likely to become the location of problems since it will almost certainly be a student rental. The fact that there are now three quiet girls with one car in one, <clears throat> in one of the units is no assurance at all that the future of this property will be similar. And once the change is approved, it will be permanent. These girls will graduate and the rental can go to anyone. The six bedrooms in this property could easily have six cars, which means three of the cars would have to park somewhere other than on the property and likely on the street. A limitation such as um, such as one occupant per bedroom is no assurance either. A common practice in Amherst is to add people to reduce the cost per person of the lease. And the enforcement in Amherst is essentially non-existent in these cases. So such a rule is meaningless. The absence of an owner on the property reduces enforcement even further. There are already multi-unit properties on the street and adding another non-owner occupied multi-unit property will continue to tip the balance in the neighborhood even farther away from families. Taylor Street is a residential street that would be greatly affected by more student housing. It will continue the ongoing townwide change to more student housing and fewer families. It will not increase the housing stock in town or provide more middle income housing opportunity, but will switch a family residence 
to student housing. The current owner lived in this property with her family and rented the other unit. Keeping the current setup would allow another young family to invest in the property and live in Amherst, building equity while having an income from the other unit. It is exactly the scenario that so many people in Amherst complain is not available. It is not appropriate, I don't believe, to be influenced by the very nice woman who we met at the site visit, who seemed honest and direct, any more than it's appropriate to be influenced if she had been unpleasant. This is not about an individual. It is about the well-being of the town, in my mind. That is who we are charged with protecting. I don't believe that this application, given the bleak history of non-owner occupied properties, is good for the town of Amherst. Thank you. Ms. Marshall. Well, I have a question about one of the possible conditions, and I don't know whether to raise that now or during the meeting. You can raise it now if you seek the, especially if you okay. want. To okay. Perspective All right. The, the third condition uh, it, it proposed is that all rooms are to be used in accordance with the floor plans. There shall be no more than one individual in each bedroom. That would seem to me to make it impossible for a family to rent one of the units. I mean, you might have a married couple in one bedroom. You might have a kid in another bedroom. So, um, it, I mean, it, rentals are available to families, but this condition would seem to make make it impossible. So that's a that's a concern of mine. Would would your concern be alleviated if it said no more than one unrelated? Yes. Some way make it so that related couple, uh, couple could share a room. Yes. And then and you, still have the, you still have the limitation on the total number of unrelated people in the property, which would be four, uh, in that unit, which would be four, because that's town law, right? So you could have a family, what I'm saying is you could have a married couple on a family of five or six if they're related, but you can only have four college students. Are there other comments? I did some work as well on, on this, um, looking at the neighborhood, because Mr. Slover's concerns resonate with me and I'm, you know, I'm trying to work through how I feel about this as well. Um, there are a lot of two family residents within, you know, Rob, you want to pull up that, um, the Taylor street maps that you had? Yeah, sure. Let me, um, just go ahead and do that real quick. So, so we have, have, um, sorry, Steve, go ahead. Yep. Is there a way to, to shrink that to 100% so all four yeah. maps are shown? Yeah, just give me one second. Okay, there you go. There we go. It's it's really hard to see it on this, so I, it's, it's difficult. So what I did is I tried to superimpose owner-occupied buildings with two family residences mm -hmm. to see what was going on in the, in the neighborhood. And as you can see from the, um, look, the owner occupants seem to be the, the majority of the parcels in the neighborhood. That's a really heavily owner occupied neighborhood. Um, it also does have a concentration of two family residences in and around that, the subject property. You're kind of in that almost circle of subject property with a few outliers. So I, I overlaid the owner occupants, owner occupied buildings with the two family residences. And I found there were um, 16 owner occupied residents and 33 
owner occupied uh, two family residences out of the 33 two family residences within the district. So about half of the, it's, it's right, it's like, it's one of those neighborhoods that's right on the, the border, the tipping point here between uh, owner occupied and non owner occupied duplexes with a large number of owner occupied single family homes. Um, not as much right in that core neighborhood but within three or 400 feet around the, the subject property, but certainly within the thousand feet. And it gives me, gives me pause about what to think about this, what this would do, even though the, um, the history of this building is that it is supposed to be owner occupied. It was um, without permission, non owner occupied for many years. And one could make the argument that it is not the, the character of the building isn't changing and therefore the neighborhood isn't being affected. But that's benefiting from that would benefit from the lack of compliance, although inadvertent, the lack of compliance with the zoning requirement that the uh, there be a special permit granted for the continued non owner occupants occupancy of that of that duplex. So there's a lot of there's a lot of complications with this, um, and it's it's this one's a difficult one for me to look at and say that this is going to be beneficial. And at the same time, you know, and, and I don't want to I don't want to give deference to um, a, a non non uh, conforming use of not not in a technical zoning term, but a non conforming use of the um, of the property over the last several years. So that's why I'm, that's some of the concerns and I'd like to hear from other board members, but that's some of the concerns that I have. And I would give, I'd like to give Mr. Dana a chance to respond to my concerns and, and how that would meet that. Being new to town, this is a real, it's a real concern of, of the neighbors. It's a real concern of everybody in town and, and especially a concern to try to foster the ability of, of middle income people to be able to use a, um, a duplex as a way to, to have a house and have some uh, and afford it and build some equity over time. Something we're really focused on uh, in the town. Yeah, yeah and, and we certainly appreciate that. Um, I, I, two comments that I wanted to make. One was that uh, just to, to remind everybody that this was granted non owner occupied status in 2017. Um, and, and that's why the current owners kind of, it wasn't intentional. They thought they had non-occupied status and didn't realize that they had to renew that permit once they, they purchased it. Um, and so, um, that's, that's why we've gone this far with this property is because, um, uh, it was kind of, a, 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 I can't say it's a small error. It is a, a an error. And um, but uh, it, it did have that non owner occupied status previously. Um, the second thing I'd like to mention is that uh, we looked at many properties in Amherst and around, and we also are not very happy with how many of the properties are being maintained. Um, we passed on lots of properties because they were in such poor condition. Um, we fully appreciate I know there's an amendment or a proposal to uh, increase the um, permit fee and, and have more um, uh, what is it in, inspections uh, and and we are big advocates for that um, and and we are very much looking forward to maintaining this property um, painting it getting it even in better condition than it is currently so um, while we, we understand your concern with the non-owner non occupied status in the town, um, all I can say is that that's not us, but- um, we, we hope that being 10 minutes away and like working and studying very closely can somewhat alleviate your concern about being an, having an absent owner and that's not, who we are and we're, we will be very close to the property um and I, we have every intention to do our best and um so i, I hope that alleviates some of your concern about the status so. 
Thank you. All right. But if I, if I may. Yes, absolutely. I'm not sure if Ms. Marshall had her hand up first. Um, you spoke and then she raised, so you can go. So while I understand the concerns about the neighborhood, um, I, I think to simply say that um, any any renter who gets this property is going to be a college student that's patently not true because it is very possible that it could be rented to a young family who um, is looking to have um, a home that cannot afford to buy one. So there's no guarantee here that this is gonna be rented by college students. And even if it's rented by college students, the fact of the matter is we live in a college town and they're a big part of our population. And while there's the concern about partying and noise and disruption to uh, the neighbors, that is not necessarily um, true of every college student. This property is away from UMass and more often than not, um, that kind of behavior is centered near campus, um, near bars, near locales. But these are quiet neighborhoods. They're genuine students who um, are looking for that kind of neighborhood. Um, to deny this application also says to people that Amherst is not a welcoming town. Um, and I don't think that's the message that we should be sending. I also think that um, through no fault of their own, um, the applicants um, find themselves in a situation. I mean, they're being very, they're doing their due diligence and saying, okay, unless we get this special permit granted, we're not going to buy the property. And that makes sense. Um, but we're also disenfranchising um, the seller here, again, um, who, quite frankly, to on the record, has lived in this property for quite some time and has done right by the neighborhood. Um, I don't remember seeing anything in the record of any complaints, um, you know, and I appreciate that we want to preserve and maintain a certain level of owner occupancy in Amherst. And to the applicant's point, um, they're not landlords living um, cities or towns away. Um, there are neighbors. And so if there are issues, um, it's something that can be addressed. So rather than, you know, denying this permit, and I, I don't know if there's any precedent for this, it could be conditional um, or see what happens. Um, if there are um, complaints, arguably um, come back before um, the board having um, the prospective buyers here. I think Rob wants to stop me. Yeah. <laughs> I think he, well, I think you should continue. I mean, unless yeah. It, and yeah. you're yeah. the board member, you should continue. I'll say, I'll say afterwards. It's no big deal. Yeah. yeah. I mean, if if they're, I mean, to understanding the concerns, I think the prospective buyers here are hearing these concerns up front, knowing that there will be expectations, there will be requirements. And if these things are not maintained, then the town can take whatever appropriate recourses that is available to the town for them. But to simply say that the fabric of the neighborhood is going to change and by granting this permit, we don't know that 100%. Um, and again, if the goal here is to allow um, people who cannot afford to buy homes live in um, a warm, friendly neighborhood, I mean, it is very, very possible that this could be the case with this property. I understand that right now that's not what it is because um, the owners have moved out, um, but there's nothing that says that a nice family isn't looking for just this house and just this street to live on. Um, Mr. White, show it quickly, but then Ms. Marshall has her hand up. Yeah, I'll be quick. So I kind of wanted to um, comment on what Mr. Henry just said and, and propose this as something we could discuss in public meeting, but the board could require as a condition a review period. So if you're concerned about, you know, 
complaints generating from the property, increase in traffic from the property, issues with the neighbors, any sort of parking issues, you can require they come back within a certain amount of time to, to be reviewed by you as the board to discuss how it's going and whether any complaints have arose. Just a general idea to throw out there if, if the board's concerned about those things. Thank you, Rob. Someone call me? Yep, I did. Yeah, oh, okay. You're, well, I think not. I'm going to put my hand down and wait for the public meeting because what I want to offer, I don't think is anything the applicant can respond to. So All right. I'll wait. <laughs> Thank All you. right, Mr. Sloviter. Okay, I'd like to just respond quickly to a couple of things that Mr. Henry said. Um, there is, I agree, no guarantee that students would end up being the renters in this property, but there's no guarantee of anything. There's no guarantee once we approve a change in the status, there's no guarantee that the prospective owners will own the house beyond a certain point. We're talking about making a major change in a neighborhood that is at the tipping point. And there is a lot of discussion in a lot of neighborhoods about the tipping point where it goes from families and single homes to students. History shows all over Amherst that rental properties are rented by students who are able to pay $1,000 a bedroom to rent properties. So it's not, it's not an unwelcoming attitude that will keep a family from renting a place. It's that a, a young family can't afford $3,000 a month to compete with student renters in order to rent a three bedroom apartment. So I think it's the economics of the situation <clears throat> that determine who ends up renting. And <clears throat> that none of this is personal. I believe that the applicants are completely sincere. I believe that the seller is sincere. This has nothing to do with that in my mind. It has to do with the nature of the town the nature of that street and what is most likely to happen if this becomes non-owner non occupied six bedrooms. I've seen it in too many properties where six bedrooms are six cars and <clears throat> distance from the UMass. The parties that take place on Southeast Street are nowhere within walking distance and they are loud. So that I'm, I'm, it's not a matter of unwelcoming. It's a matter of the character of neighborhoods. Thanks. All right. Uh, any other comments from the board? Any questions? What we're going to do is go to public comment. You'll have a chance to respond to public comments. Um, and, uh, and then we'll, after that, we'll go to the public meeting portion. Um, Now's the time for public comment. Uh, members of the public wish to comment on this application, please raise your hand, or if you're on the phone, press uh, pound nine. Um, keep your comments to around three minutes, and when you sign on, give us your name and address for the record. I'll try to moderate the time um, on my, my, my uh, phone. So who do we have, Rob? I think we have one hand up, I see. Yep. So we have Margot Welch, I believe, uh, is an attorney for the owner. So I will give speaking privileges. Um, good evening. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, I'm Margot Welch. I'm an attorney in Northampton. I've worked with the sellers for a number of years um, as they have bought um, this property and an earlier one. I just wanted to respond, I think, on two elements. One was that, uh, and I believe Angela, the owner, is on the meeting, so if it's helpful for her to make these direct statements, and that's fine, but as I anticipated that there might be conversation about parking, so I just was going to relay what the seller's experience has been with the parking, and that is that there has, they've owned the property for six years, and there has been no problem whatsoever with the use of those three spots for the two units, that their experience has been, they've had a lot of um, young professionals um, 
renting. They've actually had a family, at least one family that rented in one of the units. Um, and there hasn't been a problem with the, those three spaces being shared by what I think the board feels is uh, a, a, an imbalance. But many of the people, part of the attraction of these of this property is that it's within walking distance. So you get a, a tenant who wants to be in a, a spot like this where so many things are accessible. Um, and I don't think adding the one more bedroom is going to be any tremendous tipping point either because monitoring three parking spaces is not that onerous. Um, the, the, I would submit that you have a lovely couple in front of you who have done a wonderful job of putting together highly professional plans and uh, have you know shown you how they're going to uh, use the property and steward it. And the property also has a, has an experience where the prior owner to the current owners used it, uh, had a valid permit, special permit to use it as a um, non-owner occupied two family for, I don't know, seven to 10 years. So the property has had a, had a significant history of being used as a non-owner um, occupied uh, uh, premise. And um, I think the other thing that Mr. Um, Slavater is not being aware of is that this special permit is only good for the applicants. Once these uh, once these individuals no longer own the property, if there is going to be continued use as a non-owner occupied, uh, the new owner is going to have to take out a permit, and the board then has an opportunity to assess the situation. If if not then earlier by the conditions of your of your permit. So um, I know Angela is here. If you uh, I guess what she could participate in the public meeting part of it if that is needed, but I just wanted to weigh in and, and offer the that information and that anecdotal information. Thank you. Any other public comments? Um, not seeing any other hands raised. Um, I do want to add one thing though, Mr. Chair. Uh, Ms. Welch is correct. So for the duplexes, and I believe that's, Rob, is it the RG district the property is located or is it in the RN? The RG. So RG requires that any, I believe it's non-owner occupied duplex, no matter what, if ownership were to change, the permit becomes null and void. So the new owner would have to apply for a new special permit anyways. So that's why the previous owners were unaware that the permit had expired when they bought it in 2017, because um, I believe nobody ever reached out to them about it, or they never reached out to the town to ask about that. I don't, I don't know what the situation was, but that's that's pretty much what happened. All right. Um, if there are no other public comments, that's an opportunity for Mr. Dana to uh, respond if you need, if you wish to before we go to a public meeting. Um, yeah, I think the only additional comment I'd like to make is that um, when we were speaking with the neighbor, um, she had been pleased with the tenants that lived there saying that they had been quiet. Um, it had been a mix of graduate students and, and families actually and the, the lower unit has a history of running to families, um, particularly uh, visiting lecturers to the universities nearby that need a place to stay. So. Um, you know, it, it does have a history of families and has a history of being a quiet, complaint-free property, which is our plan for maintaining this property. Great. Any other comments from board members uh, while we're in the public hearing? If not, we'll move to the public meeting. So I would entertain, this is where we move to the public meeting portion while keeping the Without objection, we'll move to the public meeting portion with a, while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to gather additional information. Um, Ms. Marshall, you have your hand raised. Is that an objection or is that because no, you, no. Want, to, you, you want to speak? <laughs> All right. I, re um, I reserved my comment, actually, you did. too. So, um, you're just fast yeah, on the so, <laughs> so a general comment and a more specific one, start with the specific one about this, this application. Um, because it was a non-owner occupied property for 10 years or so, un unless, un unless anyone has, Rob disagrees with that. Um, it seems to me we're not, that the, that the, the baseline is, th that's what it has been. 
until recently. And so unless there's a good reason to say, no, we don't want that anymore, I'm fine with restoring it to that um, status. But um, as to the more general concern that Mr. Sloviter raised about <clears throat> uh, converting uh, owner-occupied to non-owner-occupied um, properties in town, I guess I, <laughs> I, I wish we had some, um, some principles by which, which to evaluate these because every decision feels a little arbitrary. I mean, some people, you could say, oh, well, there are no such properties here. If we allow it, we're going to start a trend. On the other hand, some parts of town already have many such properties. So one could argue that non-owner occupied duplexes should be distributed all over town and not confined or, or prioritized to one specific area. Um, and, and, and also sort of related to um, Mr. Henry's point, I don't like the, I don't like the um, approach of basing policy on stereotypes about classes of people, about kinds of people and assumptions about how they will behave and what they will do to the neighborhood. I think we, our country has very, very sorry history of um, zoning with such concerns in mind. So those are my, those are my comments at this point. Other comments from board members? I think many of us have spoken already on the, our impression about this and our in, initial impression and thoughts about the, the application. Um, and it seems to me that if I'm reading this board correctly, that we, which needs four votes to approve this special permit that I don't see if I read Mr. Sloviter correctly that there's four votes and I'm kind of on the fence. Um, am I reading you correctly, Mr. Sloviter? Yes, you are. Um, is there anything that in terms of conditions, uh, parking, um, who they would rent to, I mean, in, in terms of family, a preference for families or anything that would change your mind? Could it be rectified, could that be rectified in some way? Or is this, the, the non-owner occupancy in that neighborhood is just going to be a, um, a stopper for you? No, non-owner occupancy is, um, is from everything I've observed. I've lived in Amherst for 13 years. I've seen various areas go down in quality because of conversions of single family homes to owner to non-owner occupancy. The problems with non-owner occupancy properties are uniformly greater than owner occupied. I don't know what conditions, it's not, I'm not determined to do anything. I just don't, can't even imagine what conditions could be put on who you would rent to that would not violate about a hundred different issues in the civil, in the civil rights codes. You know, you can't rent to somebody who's over a certain age, under a certain age, you have to have kids, you can't have kids. I can't imagine how that could be defined. So in a, in a more, in a kinder world, I would love to be able to believe, I do believe the applicants and what they're saying, but in a, in a kinder world where you could just have confidence that situations would be handled properly, that's something else. I, I can't, 
once the rules are changed, I can't imagine how we could put, what conditions we could put on anything that would give me confidence that a non-owner occupied, I don't know why I have such a problem with that phrase, why that a non-owner occupied property would be as effectively compliant with the rules as an owner occupied property. They're in my neighborhood a lot. So I've observed them directly. And no, the, the answer is I, I feel it is an enormous factor in, in home conversions in Amherst and not for the better. So if you can come up with something that makes sense, I'm open to it, but I can't see it. So, so um, Mr. Henry, go ahead. So while well, I would agree that you cannot put conditions when it comes to class, because that be not legal. Um, I, I, I think big part of the concern here is now this is six bedroom property and three parking spaces. So I think conditions around those kinds of things um, may deter what I'm hoping is part of the concern is that you, know, you have um, too many cars or now the street residents or, or owners cannot find parking on the street or loud noise complaints and things like that. So as you heard from um, Ms. Marshall, it, it isn't a quiet neighborhood, and that's arguably part of the appeal um, where people can walk to things. So maybe think around, you know, those kinds of terms as to say, okay, even though um, going back to Mr. Wachilla that, you know, the permit can be conditional and can be reviewed. So maybe we start there. And if your concerns are not met, then after review period, then we can come back and say, okay, um, you know, we have these temporary conditions in place and this is what happened. Therefore, you know, you stand by your initial position that this was not the right thing to do. In such a case, like you're, you can add, add additional conditions. I think you'd be hard, the board would be hard pressed to say that the current owner has to divest, has to either live there or divest themselves of that property. I mean, I, I don't know that, I don't know the remedy from a conditional, what I'm saying is I'm not sure that there's a remedy that can be imposed uh, via conditions. Um, if you had a, if you went back and said, geez, we made the wrong mistake, we made a mistake. You can add additional conditions, but you can't, um, you can't get, I don't know that you can get to the place where you require owner occupancy uh, and you deny it. So you can't order. revoke a permit? You can't revoke a it, special it, permit? I, I think that'd be really hard. Mr. Mora, can you elucidate that better than I can or am I wrong? No, no, you, you're right, Mr. Judge. You, you really can't do that. You can't get, you don't get a second chance to review the permit down the line. The The review period is, is helpful, useful. I think you should seriously consider that in these types of applications. Uh, we did have used it multiple times in the past, and it really is an opportunity for the board to ensure that the management plan is effective in addressing the conditions that it put on the permit. So it really is it's, it, the most important thing to do with these permits is to get the set of conditions in there now initially, and then the review period can make sure that the management plan and, and the management actions of the owner are uh, satisfying those conditions. If not, you can ask them to make changes. And that's really the point, make changes to their management of the property. Uh, a change to the condition would only have to, could only be if it's agreed upon by the owner at that point. Um, and it oftentimes those reviews are not done in a public hearing setting anyway. They're done in a meeting setting uh, where, you know, the permit isn't, isn't up for amendment. It's just simply being reviewed and update to the board and staff is providing kind of our experience of what's happened over that review period. And if the results of the review period are unsatisfactory for whatever reason, and the owners at that time 
don't wish to comply with additional restrictions or change behavior. You're, all you can do is enforce existing regulations. You can't force a new condition on them at that point. Right. So enforcement capability would be there. There's there's penalties that can be imposed for non-compliance with conditions of the permit. That's pretty straightforward. Um, you know, court action. You know, if it ever rose to that level, could result in revocation of a special permit. Uh, but it would have to be a, a court order to have that happen. It would be something we can just do. Um, you know, ourselves. Uh, and then, of course, the rental registration program. Uh, will have effect on this, uh, especially if changes are made, you know, to the program to enhance it. Uh, there'd be uh, the the um, you know the the right to to rent the property could be lost or suspended or revoked uh, through the through review of that uh, you know the conditions of that bylaw. Got it. Well, normally I like to try to get consensus uh, amongst our members, and I think that I'd like what I'd like to do is explore the opportunity for um, withdrawal and resubmittal. If that's, I, I want to just describe that. Not, I'm not making a, a case one way or the other right now, but I want to describe what can be done. If it, if tonight the vote is, there's not four votes for approving this application with the conditions, um, it's denied. And then you are, you can't, uh, and it can be denied with prejudice or without prejudice, or you know it can be, it's denied. And you can't come back within, for two years to, with essentially the same proposal. If you withdraw the proposal without prejudice, you can, you can, um, Come back with a mo you can come back with a proposal, arguably modified in some way to to um, respond to concerns you heard from the board, or you or if it's denied or if it's you withdraw with prejudice, I think it's another two years before you can come back with essentially the same um, proposal. Is that correct, Rob? Yeah. So if, if you're not going to get four votes tonight. Um, possibility you can ask for a withdrawal and you can ask to come back at a later date and you would have um, a panel assigned randomly as it was assigned to you this time that would um, take it up but it would be of somewhat it would and it wouldn't be this it doesn't have to be it can be the same proposal uh, I think am I right if you did not if it's if you withdraw without prejudice it can be the same proposal yes it can be the same proposal in that case so I'm, I'd like to give you guys a chance to talk because I don't think you, this um, came up. I don't think you were anticipating this. Um, and so what I'd like to do is take five minutes to use the bathroom, take a break, give you a chance to talk off camera with all of us, with, between yourselves, and we'll come back uh, after five minutes and we can have a further discussion and we can get some more input from you and from the board members, quite frankly, as to what how we should proceed. So let's do that. Let's take a five minute break. It's 730. It's a good time to take a break anyway. And I think that gives you a shot at um, having a conversation. All right. Okay, we'll be back at uh, 740.
All right. Um, we're back. Um, I guess that um, I would, one of the things that I would say that I would encourage other board members to look at is the number of the, if you overimpose the owner occupancy status of the building with the two family residents in the area, everything in that area of the, that surrounds the subject property, most all of the, not everything, most all of the um, duplexes are owner occupied. You have more own, non-owner occupied farther out from this, this particular house. And it does speak to me that there's a concern. I have a concern about the owner occupancy status in this neighborhood where so many of the buildings are currently owner occupied, single families or owner occupied two family residences. And it's a, it's a concern that I, I really do have. And, and, um, and it gives me great pause about this, but I guess I wanted to hear from other board members then give Mr. Dana and, uh, you know, um, I got your first name wrong. <laughs> if you would help me with your name, I mispronounced it in the beginning. Um, uh, help really, me with your name. I go by Rosie as well, so. Rosie, all right. Um, a chance to speak after that, but I'd like to give other board members a chance to speak first and then hear from what you guys have to say. So, Mr. Henry. So, if I remember correctly, from the from the last meeting that we had with this application, there was only one person who voiced opposition. I mean, looking at this map, there are a number of houses on here that um, are both owner occupied and not owner occupied. There was only one person that came to that meeting, and now there isn't even any at this meeting voicing opposition for this. So, I think we should consider that as well. Um, the other thing to think about, I, I, um, I think there's, um, if they withdraw the application and come back, um, the chances of getting a completely separate board is not high. Um, I believe we're a seven majority, seven board member. But we have, right, currently we have seven. Um, yes. We currently have seven. The CRC is looking at appointing is taking applications now to to fill the the full member position as as well as if there is a a, a, a um a associate member also. That's so correct. so my point is if if they so because of that I don't there would be some overlap somewhere, but mm -hmm. if the position is filled, then you know in in fairness my suggestion would be that. The four of us that are here do not sit on the next board at all. And if the decision is still the same or the, the posture is still the same, then it's telling to say, you know, a completely different panel essentially voted the same way. We wouldn't have enough people to form a quorum and then make a decision. I, I, I know. If if the if we have if the position is filled and it's beyond seven, but but I don't know how long that will take. Yeah, I don't either. And I don't know that I would require the condition the the uh, next panel based on serving in the first one. Um, I would give I give regular members the first shot at this, and then associate members if the regular member couldn't be part of it. And that's how I would typically how we typically fill these panels is that full members get first shot if their schedule permits it. I think that's probably the way we should keep it. Unless there's a disqualifying reason by that's disclosed by the full member or the associate member. Ms. Marshall. So the zoning bylaw allows this kind of conversion mm -hmm. if conditions are met. So I'm curious to hear from those of you who, who object. Is there is there any conversion scenario that you would support anywhere in town or I mean is it a matter of I don't know that this is appropriate in some neighborhoods but not other neighborhoods I I'm just curious Mr. Sloviter 
Well, since I seem to have become the poster child for this attitude, I'm going to defend it by telling you that every time a discussion comes up where somebody mentions some neighborhoods and not other neighborhoods, it is divisive and it is not productive. This is not about it's appropriate in someone else's neighborhood, but not appropriate in mine. This is not in my, in my immediate neighborhood. This is not about a specific neighborhood. It is not about the economic level of, of the neighborhood. This is about, in my mind, simply the, the transition of family homes to student housing. And we have seen the damage a couple of years ago, one of our neighbors, um, did a whole survey on, on police complaints. I don't have the data with me, so I don't have it. I can get it. I can get, get in touch with Ralph and get the information. The number of police calls, the number of all sorts of violations associated with non-owner occupied student housing was clearly greater than when there was an owner on site. The, the owner had a vested interest in making sure that things were complied with. So it's not about neighborhoods, it's, it's about supervision. College students behave a certain way. I don't accept that just because they're away from home, they get to do whatever they want. I see the effects of it on my street. I see the effects of it every Sunday morning and the number of red cups I have to pick up out of my hedges and beer cans. This is not anti-student. It's not anything other than maintaining the characteristics of, of a town that is welcoming to families, which it's not, it's becoming unwelcoming to families because families can't afford anything. Families can't afford $1,000 a bedroom. So th this is not, there's nothing personal in, in any of this. I think these, the, the, the two applicants here strike me as lovely people. I'd like to have dinner with them, but that's not what, they're not applying to come to my house for dinner. They're applying to convert an, uh, something that has been owner occupied to become student housing. And I have no confidence that the three quiet girls with one car are going to be followed by three more quiet girls with one car. Who knows? Nobody puts an ad in the paper to get eight raucous drunks into their house, but it seems that a lot of them manage to do that. So I'm not against any individual I am looking out for the neighborhoods in, in this town that I think could use some help in, in continuing to be a place where it's suitable to raise children. And if you wanna work at the university, you don't have to live in Greenfield because that's the only place you can afford. I can speak to this, if I can speak to this, I'd say that the question before the board is, in your judgment, as members of the board, can this application fit the findings we have to make under 9.22, and I would say under 10.38, the first section of 10.38. Under 9.22, the board has to find that this is that we're authorized to act under the provisions of the section under a special permit allowing a non um, use of a building, non-conforming use of a building structure or land to be changed to spe specified use, not substantially different in character or in its effect on the neighborhood or the property in the, in, in the vicinity. That's one thing. The second thing, and you can argue that it's, yeah, we're changing the use because that's been effectively used that way even though it wasn't permitted. So we'll go to the next one, go to 10.38 and the first part of 10.38 talks about the proposal is suitably located in the neighborhood in which it is proposed and or the total town as deemed appropriate by the special permit granting authority. The proposal is compatible with existing uses and other uses permitted by right. So it's suitably located. 
And that's your judgment. That's our judgment to make as members of this board is whether we think we can make those findings. And the question, it seems for all of us is, is this a situation where one more non-owner occupied rental property um, duplex is going to start causing a change in the neighborhood that's not suitable versus a place where there's a lot of different non-owner occupied place and it doesn't change the character of the neighborhood. That's the kind of thing you have to deal with. And that's what I think we have to struggle with is our decision here is, can we make that finding? And if you can't make that finding, then you can't vote for this. If you can make that finding, then you can we'll go through the findings and you can make that finding. So I think that's the way to answer to look at it, Ms. Marshall. I don't think it's so much this neighborhood or that neighborhood, but what does this do to that neighborhood? And um, the specific, this specific um, application. So that's where I, I think that's the way, I, the only way I can answer your question. And I, and I think the, the map that was presented shows that we can make the finding pursuant to 10.38. Well, I mean, that's, I think that's your, that's your view, Mr. Henry, that's true. I mean, you could, you can look at it that way. I think you could also look at it and overlay which ones of those two family residences are now owner occupied. And most of the ones that are around that property are owner occupied. You have to do, you have to overlay the one over the other. And I did that just because I was curious because I drove around the neighborhood. I wanted to see how many had three or four mailboxes, how many had four or five, you know, um, uh, utility and water, uh, gas meters or electric meters out, try to get a judge for what the neighborhood is. But this helps me look at it to the extent that this is good um, information. And when, so, I, and, and when I, I went to the site visit and the street that this property is on um, is ex seems as if it's exactly what that street is. Now, it's multifamily dwelling, whether or not they're all owner occupied, not owner occupied, but they have multiple mailboxes, multiple meters. They're, um, it's That is the character of this street. Now, in fairness, we don't know if they all have owners living in them, but I would suggest when a house has four meters, it would suggest not. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I think on that street, when I looked at the map of the three, um, four, five, two family residences on that immediate block and the next block over, um, one, two, th three, four, one, two, three, and counting this one, are and three are not. It's split right now as the owner occupied duplexes on that block. And then the other two properties are owner occupied properties on that block. So it's, you know, it's, you know, this is that tip. It looks to me like this in that area, you got, you got the tipping point. It's different if you're looking at other, other areas. So, you know, this is where you have to make your judgment and each individual board member is going to make their judgment. And what I would don't want to do is, is run through, I'll take all the time and effort to go through with this. If, it, if it's not going to be approved and we have an opportunity for, um, another up for them to withdraw and come back with a different proposal or uh, to do, decide what they want to do if they're not going to get this special permit now is what I'd like to go to. If, and, but I don't want to cut off debate. I think this, these are all exactly the kind of questions that we have to deal with as a board. This is what's, these are the tough questions that we have. And we're going to have more than this application before us in the future that deal with these questions. And so this is a good discussion to have. Mr. Dana, do you have, after the five minute break <laughs> and um, the benefit of being older and having to have uh, five minute breaks every now and then, um, did that give you any, did it give you an opportunity to, to think through what you wish to do and what, what do you want to say to us at this point, if anything, do you want to go forward? What do you want to do? Um, yeah, we did, we, we did briefly speak with the, um the seller's attorney as well. Um, and we do feel that it's best to withdraw. Um, I don't recall which version of withdraw was the one that allowed- Without prejudice, I'm sure. 
yeah, I think that's the way. <laughs> um, uh, so is that, uh, just to make sure I understand, that means that the seller has the ability to apply or we have the ability to apply again uh, in, in, in some modification of this, correct? That's correct. Yeah. So I believe that's the that's the that is the course of action that we would like to take. Yeah. Rob, I just want to make sure that we're that they're clear with what their options are. If they do that, can did he? I think he stated it correctly. Can you confirm that? That that's correct. If the board grants uh, withdrawal without prejudice, then an application can be filed again in the future. Okay. All right. Um, so we have. Two decisions to make. The first um, precludes the second. Okay. The applicant has asked for um, the ability to withdraw this without prejudice. That takes a majority of the vote of the board. It takes four votes. I think Rob, right? It takes four votes because it's on a special permit. It takes four votes to do that. Um, and then if we proceed to, if that doesn't pass, then we proceed to the the um, conditions and to the eventual um, decision on this special permit, you need four votes to approve it. And otherwise it's denied. So um, I guess the motion before us, I would entertain a motion before us to permit the withdrawal, to agree to the withdrawal without prejudice and allow the applicant to uh, resubmit at some later point. And I'd look so for a motion to share that. Uh, you know, Mr. Henry, let's get the motions out and then we can, um, we can have a discussion, but I first want to, about that motion, but first want to have the motion out there. Is there, is there such a motion? Ms. Marshall moves it. Is there a second? Aye. Okay. So the motion is made and seconded. And Mr. Henry, go ahead. Here's time for discussion on that motion to withdraw. I, I, I would waive any kind of um, argument. I think we've had significant debate on this. Um, so I think at this point, we should just um, afford them the opportunity to with an up or down vote. <clears throat> on the motion to withdraw? Yes. Okay, all right. Any other discussion? If not, the motion, the vote occurs on the motion to permit withdrawal without prejudice. Of application special permit CBA. I just want to get the right one here. 2024-04. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry. Henry votes aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. The motion carries. Um, the motion, the special permit application is withdrawn. And uh, thank you for your time, Mr. Dana, and, and your consideration. And uh, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. Next item on the agenda is, I had a longer script than, than that. The next item on the agenda is FY2024-05. Jai Fuller Properties Inc. request a special permit under section 10.33 of the zoning bylaws to modify ZBA FY 2018-04 to reflect a change in property management and incorporate an updated management plan in accordance with conditions three and five at 320 West Street, map 20A, parcel 103, RN residential neighbor, neighborhood residence zoning district. On this panel and for the next, this panel and the next subject, um, we have myself, Mr. Henry, Mr. White, Mr. Sloviter, and Ms. Marshall as panelists. So welcome back, Mr. White. Uh, there was no um, there was no site visit for this matter. Submissions include the following: um, ZBA FY24. Dash 05 application form, management plan, management plan, additional information for apartments, and a complaint response form, an example lease agreement, and a management agreement. Staff submissions include the 2018 04 decision document 
and the 20, FY 2018 parking plan. Um, is there any, uh, who's going to speak for the petitioner? So um, Jerry Fuller is in the audience and I'll promote them to panelists so they can present their application to the board. Yep. And just a reminder for the board, this is for an existing special permit. They're just changing their management and they require a modification to the existing permit in order to do so. Ms. Fuller? Hi, sorry, I was popped off. That's, that's okay. Off. <laughs> it's, a, it's sometimes hard to get this started. Can you give yeah. us your name and address for the record? It's Jai Fuller, and I'm living at 189 Long Plain Road in Leverett. Got it. All right, you, you may proceed. Yeah, so um, this is very straightforward. I took over management of 320 West Street. Um, and the plans have not changed other than the um, landscape maintenance company is grassroots landscaping now, um, which is reflected in our application. Um, I think we put in a motion sensor light recently, um, but otherwise I think it's all the same. Pretty straightforward. Yeah. I mean, there's no other changes than the change of, of the mat, the uh, landscape company, the management company, and and that I took over management. So yeah, have both you and the landscape company that have changed the changes. Um, the only thing I would ask is a question about the landscaping, and maybe sure. this maybe this was done beforehand. Um, since and since you changed the landscaping company, it's probably appropriate to ask. But there was some in the earlier special permit. There was um uh, um trees that had to be planted and rhododendrons and planters that had to be placed along the driveway and looking i it wasn't a site visit so i went to google maps which, like we all do and i was trying to find the the uh, the planters and the rhododendrons and other things that were supposed to have been planted along the it would be the west side of the driveway the trees are at the end of the driveway. They seem to be there. There were three trees that were required. And then there were yeah. planters and, and shrubbery along the driveway. And I didn't see any there. Can you talk, just briefly talk about that? And, and Or perhaps the landscape plan has been modified with the permission of the building commissioner and that just isn't reflected here. So either one of those, um, either what you plan to do with it or if it's been modified would uh, satisfy my question. Yeah. Um, I do know that some of the plantings have died. Um, and so we actually removed some dead bushes. I'm not sure if they were rhododendrons, but um, I was th thinking springtime, we would put in some new plantings where things have been removed. And I can refer back to the plan, the old plan of what was gonna happen with rhododendrons and we can go forward with that. All I would say is, you know, that, that was a condition of the original permit that these the plans be done, that this plan to be done and it be maintained. And I would, so you're, you're supposed to do that. So if yeah. your representation to us tonight is that you're gonna do that in the spring and you'll you'll have the regular plan, that's, that's, that's fine with me. I didn't have any, Mr. Wachilla. So uh, my question involves me screen share, Mr. Chair, if that's okay, I can yep. do that really quick. So um, I'm just gonna briefly pull this up. There was one question I had regarding, oh, my apologies, I just have to switch this over. There we go. Regarding the parking layout. Uh, so I was a little bit confused from the documents that were submitted previously. Could you, Jay, could you just clarify how the cars park in the driveway or in the parking area that's identified here. Um, just because it's a little bit confusing, we don't know if they're they're parking perpendicular to the house or if it's parallel, like it's shown here. It it is parallel, like it's shown, except that the the 
first and second. So you have three over to the right side of the parking area. And what we did is we're having the second two be on the left side of that driveway before you get to the turn in where you'd access the basement garage door. So it's it's just two up in the front. Right here. And then, yep. Okay. Oh, no. can you see my, you can't see my cursor, can you? No. That's, <laughs> That's not helpful. Okay. You have to translate um, it for Rob. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so where your cursor is, Rob, that right. nine foot spot there, and then the far right corner, those right. two are just like that. Yep. And then be those two beneath that on the right are actually going to be on, they're on the left side before you get to that pull in. So down here. Yes, exactly. Okay. And this way they, the tenants can access the recycle and garbage bins which are over to the right there right here yes okay thank you sure all right um are there any other questions from members of the board does the uh you you mentioned Manage other property in town, so you're the new man. You're the new property manager for this property. That's is that correct? That's correct. And you have, a, and you, you are the the uh, designated person on the complaint designation form. That's correct. Problems with the neighbors. Okay. Um. And the other thing on the man, there was. I don't think we can do anything about this because it hasn't already. It wasn't included, but um, is there a limit? On, oh, there's a maximum of ten guests shall be allowed on the site at one time. That 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 condition still follows through, does it not, Rob? It does. So let me let me double check to make sure it was included in the proposed conditions. Yeah. Um, and then you also intend that the while he looks that up, another one is that you have some existing lights. You know, they, the original permit required that they be downcast and shielded. It was before we used the term dark sky compliant, but that's, that's what it means. Are they currently that way? And if you put yes. any new lighting in, are you pledging that you will um, do that? It will be yes. downcast and dark sky compliant. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll mean right. to interject, but... Um... The condition that no more than 10 guests on the property at all times is in there as a proposed condition and the condition on the lights being dark sky compliant and downcast is as well. So both right. those conditions are reflected in the list that we have in the project application report. All right. I have no other questions. Okay. Um, is there any public? Did you wish to say anything more? Is there any board members that have a comment? If not, is there any public comment? Let's see any hands raised, Mr. Chairman. Uh, for those of you who no want to do public raised. comment, use the hit raise hand function, or if you're on the phone, press um, pound nine. Not seeing any hands up, Mr. Chairman. That being the case, uh, we'll move to the public meeting portion. Uh, while keeping the public hearing open in case we need to get additional information. Um, my res my um, impression of this is that this is a simple change um, and we should get approved the uh, special permit request. Marshall. Yeah, I, I only, um, I remember that Rob flagged the possibility that we would maybe change some of the conditions from requiring public hearings to public Meetings. Oh, good. So, right. so eight. So I've. So eight. Yes. Condition eight B, C, and G are all hearings, but D is a meeting, and I don't. Actually, and K. Um, so I don't know. I don't know what the rationale is for <laughs> doing you know, one. On, on things like, on things like this, we can make that rational. We can determine that ourselves. And I think for the most part, doing it at a public meeting makes more sense 
for most of these, a management plan, a public meeting. Um, you know, if we need to get information from the public because the management plan is insufficient and there's causing a trouble in the, in the neighborhood, we can get public input, even at a public meeting, uh, if we deem it necessary. But we don't have to go through the whole formal process of a hearing. So, but we could also get information from the applicant during a public meeting. We don't correct. have to do that in a hearing. We don't have to. It's, it's up okay. to the, the the chair to say we're going to, you know, have some input from the public at this, and we do it all the time. So, or and from the applicant, so we do it all the time. And so, I'd rather move to a public hearing for B. C, stays a public meeting for D. And I, but I don't think, I mean, if you're gonna have a, a new structure constructed, I think G should remain in a public hearing. Is there any, Rob, is, Rob or Rob, is there any reason not to move to public hearings for those three, and, but also, but remain on a public hearing for the uh, for new structures? Do you mean move to public meet? They're already. Say, I reversed it. I want to go to public meetings for the full <laughs> three and public hearing for the new construction. That's what I mean. Uh, Mr. Chair, I I agree with your logic on changing it to public meeting because um, that's what we've done for other recent permits for residential properties. Uh, change in management plan and change in management company. Um, as you can see, there was another condition somewhere in here regarding change of ownership has to be done during a public meeting process. Um, that was the case for the existing permit. Um, so they've changed ownership, I believe, once since the special permit became effective. Uh, I don't remember the exact year. I think it was 2018, 2017. Uh, and they only had to go to a public meeting. But, you know, for some reason, this condition was worded that change in management requires a public hearing. So I, I think changing those two conditions to public meeting would would be would make sense. All right. Okay. With that, um, is there any other discussion? I'd like to go to the conditions and then we can make the findings that we have to make. So I would move, I would accept the motion that we, that we approve the conditions as outlined in the project application, draft public application report with the changes that we have just um, agreed to or that were just stated and without objection. Um, is there any, is there, do I have a motion to, to accept those conditions as modified? So move. Second. All right. Any discussion on the motion to accept the conditions as modified? If not, vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Marshall? Aye. Sloboder. I saw you say I, but Wait I didn't hear it. Hi. All right. Unmuted, um, yes. <laughs> and then um, to make the findings we have to make, um, we have to make findings under 10.381 uh, and 10.380 are not applicable. 382, 383, 385, and 387 are not applicable. 10.384, dealing with adequate and appropriate facilities to provide for the proper operation of proposed use. They have adequate and appropriate facilities to properly operate the site as evidenced by the operation without complaint. 10.386, it's in conformance with the signs. Um, it's, it's all, we've discussed that. The applicant to clarify where the stock spots are located. It was done. And the uh, plan is attached to the uh, the application. 387, 388 are not applicable. 389 deals with uh, disposal or storage of sewage, refuge, recyclable. Um, you have appropriate facilities available for trash collection, and you have a trash plan, a company that picks up the trash. 10.390, not applicable. 10.391, not applicable. 392. Um, it's not applicable, and, and Raj, you had a, Rob, you had a note about clarify the existence of screening. That wasn't something that I addressed. Is the screening for the the lights of the cars into the appropriate in the neighboring yes. property? 
That's correct. So um, the Amherstonian bylaw requires that um, parking areas have screening to protect light intrusion from cars onto neighboring property, specifically neighboring property windows. Um, I, I guess the board could consider asking the applicant whether or not such screening exists or if the cars are parked in a way where it's not going to go directly into somebody's window that's like a neighboring property owner. Um, so I don't know if, Mr. Chair, if you want to ask that yep. of the applicant, totally up to you. Yeah, I think I'd like to know, is there screening there for the, uh, the lights that go to the neighboring properties? There's a fence to the right of the parking area that screens from the, the property on the, that would be, yeah, the backside. And then when they pull in, there's no house straight on in the way that they park. The houses are all set forward closer to the road. So it's just people's backyards with no windows or homes there. So I have Google Maps up and what I see is the fence along as you describe it, and then the trees that were required to be planted in front of the cars parked at the end of the driveway, the two cars, the two spaces you have there. And you say there's not a house on the other, directly on the other side, but even if there was, that looks to be some, looks to be sufficient screening in that. And you are required to replace those if they should die, so. <laughs> those ones you, are doing well. <laughs> yeah, they, they look healthy, but if they aren't, um, you're required to replace those. All right. Um, I think that deals with 10.392, 10.393. Um, you're required to have downcast lighting. Yeah. And they've represented that they are, or, or and any that aren't, they'll, re they'll replace with downcast lighting, correct? Yes. All right. Um, Proposal avoids, you know, 394 is not applicable, 395 is not applicable, 6 and 7 are not applicable, and 10.398. Um, well, I don't know if it's not applicable, but it certainly meets with the general purpose and intent of the bylaw by having well-managed properties in town. So for that reason, I think I feel comfortable in moving that we accept the, the make findings required under 10.38. Ms. Marshall. I, I would hope that they submit a clearer parking plan because I couldn't make heads or tails of it. And, and it sounds like some of the actual parking spaces are not even marked on this. So, right? So. Right. So I guess let's um, you approve the condition. Um, the finding, we can, add, we, can, we can add a new condition. That's fine. That you will provide a, um, a, a, a better, a, a, a new parking plan, a, a new representation of the parking plan to the building commissioner and the building commissioner uh, will approve it. Does that work? Good enough? All right, yeah. that should be a, the, another condition. And if you would move that, oh, we're still under, we'll deal with that after we make the findings. So that's, so let's have a vote on the findings. The vote, I would um, entertain a motion to approve the findings under 10.38. Mr. Sloboda moves it. Do I have a second? Aye. I've got two seconds. Um, is there any discussion? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the findings. I vote, chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. We've made the findings and an additional ability to make those findings would be found in a new condition, condition um, nine. I guess it would be a uh, condition that provide a new park, a, a redraw, a, a new draft of a parking plan that the building commissioner shall approve. It has to be approved. The new parking plan has to be approved by the building commissioner. And what we're anticipating there is that it's a better drawing and representation of your existing parking plan and that he can approve it. Yes, Rob. Uh, so, you know, since this isn't like pending any approval or, you know, approval for building permit um, if they submit this update parking plan to us. Uh, would you want it to be submitted to the building commissioner within a certain amount of time, Mr. Chair, or do you think that Let's doesn't do, matter? I think we do it within 60 days. 60 days of permit yeah. approval or granting of the special permit? Um, within, well, let's, I don't want to grant a special permit if they don't do it. So um, okay. how quickly can, Jai, how quick, Ms. Fuller, how quickly can you get a new drawing in 10 days a week 
Uh, give me two weeks. Please. Two weeks. And you can wait for the permit to be approved for two weeks? Can you file yep. for two weeks? All right. So we've got two weeks. And the parking plan will be with um, Mr. Morak. All right. We need to vote on that condition as stated. Parking plan within two, a new representation of the parking plan within two weeks to be approved by the building commissioner before the permit can be filed. Do I have a motion on that I'll condition? That. Yep. And there's a second. Second. Any discussion? Not. The vote occurs on the motion. I chair votes aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Ms. Marshall. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. All right. Is there any? Uh, the next order of business is to uh, vote on the special permit application. I would entertain a motion to approve the special permit application. Special permit application ZBA 20. Uh, no, I'm sorry. To amend. I need to have the. I'm sorry. I need to have the. Uh, Agenda in front of me, special permit. Rob, can you give me the FY? Yeah, sure. Uh, FY 2024 05. 05. Yep. 05. And, Got it. and that's to amend um, ZBA FY, FY 2018. Dash, right? Yep, dash 04. 04. Yep. With conditions. Um, and to close the hearing on such application. Do I have a motion? So move, Mr. Chair. Uh, Mr. Mr. Henry moves. Mr. Is there a second? Mr. Sloviter. <laughs> now we got a lot of them. All right. Any discussion on the motion? If not, the chair votes uh, calls a vote. Roll call vote. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Sloviter. Aye. Marshall. Aye. All right. Special permit is granted. This public hearing on this matter is closed. And uh, we'll be looking forward to your parking plan to be delivered to the uh, building commissioner. All right. Thank you Mr. very Chair. much. Um, Mr. Chair, do you mind if I just um, tell the applicant the next steps, if that's okay? Well, go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll be quick. To get my paper in order. Yep. So, um, Jay, so basically what happens next is that um, the board's going to render a written decision document of the special permit tonight um usually they take about a week and a half to two weeks to to sign it and then once that document is officially signed um we follow it with the town clerk and then once it's filed with the town clerk that starts a 20-day appeal period in which members of the public or any aggrieved parties can appeal the decision of the board to a higher court it could be land court it could be superior court um i don't anticipate that happening for your special permit application uh so after the 20-day appeal period has ended um, you have to go to the town clerk's office to get a, a true copy attested from them of the special permit decision document. And then you have to get a certificate of no appeal. I will send a cover letter to you once the decision document is rendered outlining these instructions to you, just so it's clear. Um, and then after that, you can file the um, official permit with the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds, which would make the permit effective. As for the condition where the board required a parking plan, I would assume that's two weeks within the vote to approve, which is today. So that means two weeks from today would be the time to submit that um, new parking plan layout that shows where the spots are to the building commissioner, uh, Mr. Moore, who's on the meeting with us today. You can also send that directly to me as well. Um, and I could share that with Mr. Moore and we can review it together. Otherwise, that's the process from here on out uh, to get you to the finish line. Do you have any other questions for us? I don't think so. That was helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. And we'll keep in touch. Great. All right. Thanks. Have All a good right. Good luck. Thanks. Next order of business is ZBA FY 2024-06. Priscilla White requests for a special permit under sections 3.3241 and 9.22 of the zoning bylaw to change the use of an existing single family residence with an attached ADU into a converted dwelling with two units, five bedrooms total at 318 Lincoln Avenue, map 11C, parcel Hi. 55, RG, general residence zoning district. 
Um, we had a site visit on Tuesday where um, Ms. Marshall and myself and Rob um, walked around the site. Uh, we looked at the, the house, the parking, the lighting for the parking, uh, the, the ADU, walked outside of the ADU, also observed the, the uh, storage shed that was there, walked along the property line and out to the front. Um, it was generally, I don't think there's many questions to ask regarding the, from the um, site visit that need to be reported. It was pretty much just the observe the location. Ms. Marshall, do you have anything to add? No, it's a, other well, it's a lovely spot. <laughs> Um, all right, so go through the, um, the submissions. Submissions are um, application, uh, FY 2024-06 application form, management form, complaint response form, sample lease agreement, and photographs depicting lighting and parking. Staff submissions include floor plans with the approval of the ZBA FY 2006-00046 dated June 26, 2006, three sheets, first, second, and third floor. Site plan from 2004, ZBA FY 2014-00014, dated February of 2014, a lot coverage map. The decision of in 2006 of ZBA FY 2006-46 and the ZBA FY 2014-00014 decision document. We do have one, um, I think we had one public comment, Rob, that you you um, forwarded to us from um, Butter, uh, and I don't have his name. Yes, yeah, so his name is um, Stephen Spiegel. Yep. And it was he, submitted on November eighth of of basically yesterday. Yes, twenty twenty three. Yep. An email submitted to yep. the town. Mm -hmm. I think that's it for submissions, and um, I guess I would. Uh, and Kurt, let's bring the, um, the petitioner. Yep. So I uh, I sent Miss White a panelist invitation, and she should be rejoining us shortly. There she is. So she just has to unmute herself and then um, turn on the video. There we go. Ms. White, would you just give your name and address for the record? Priscilla White, 318 Lincoln Ave. Thank you. Um, this is your opportunity to present your, what you, your special permit to the board, what you intend to, to do while you're proposing this. Okay. Um, gives you a very brief little history. Um, We've lived here at 318 Lincoln Ave, uh, which is the last block before Mass Avenue um, for 21 years. When we moved here in 2002, there was a balance of families and student rentals here. At first we were a three generational family um, with a, a daughter and a son-in-law and two young grandsons. And um, on this block, this 300 block, there were 10 children and two ge three generational families um, among us. Uh, so we built the mother-in-law apartment, which is the ADU on the back of the house to give us a little more room and some privacy. And over the years that we've been here, the 21 years, um, almost all of the families on this block have left and sold their homes. And those houses have become student rentals. Now there are no families or children left on this block. Um, and over the time, the noise level and student traffic has greatly increased. Thursday, Friday, Saturday nights are especially distressing for us with noise, students. Um, there are a lot of students roaming this block. And um, so there's a lot of yelling and noise. Um, 
but the final blow has been the opening of the new 600 bed dorm, which is three doors down from our house. Uh, so the foot traffic and the car traffic has really increased with the opening of that dorm, which we never expected was gonna be on our block when we came here. Um, we no longer really have a good feeling of, uh, or any peace of mind about living here. It had been our hope to age in place and we held out when the other families left this block. And, um, and now with the dorm, we're uh, needing to change our minds about being able to stay. So within the next year, we're planning to sell this house and um, move elsewhere. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it, it kind of, there isn't even a tipping point to, to talk about. We're really the last holdout. Um, and so we're in support of our plan to move, we're requesting a special permit to change the use of the existing single family house um, with the attached ADU. Um, and if this is approved, we plan to continue to live here for probably about a year before we'll move and to keep our tenant in the back and it'll remain owner occupied until the house sells and we move. Um, almost all the houses on our block are non-owner occupied student rentals all the way down on our side and um, across the street. Um, and in addition, we have, there will be 800 dormitory, new dormitory beds in this UMass complex that has been built on this block. Um, so the character is no longer a mix of owner occupied and student rentals. And in order to get a fair value on the sale of our house, we realize a non-owner occupied property status is needed. But while we're here, we'll continue to manage the trash and recycling after a change in use. And the parking will remain four cars in the recently paved driveway. Um, there's no parking allowed on the street. We have snow removal with Four Seasons property maintenance and that will continue. And that includes plowing the driveway and shoveling the walkways to the house in the street. And the stewardship of the property will continue to be performed by us, including pruning of the hedges and any seasonal raking and mowing of the lawn. So. All right, um, so your plan is to uh, change from having the ADU to having two units. And you have a total of how many bedrooms in the, the building upon once this uh, application is, yeah. if it's approved? There are four in the front mm -hmm. and there's one in the back unit. And you didn't, you're not making any structural changes, so you'd have one tenant, a one bedroom, second uh, second unit, and then you'd have the four bedroom first unit, correct? Right. Okay. So the difference is moving from an ADU to a, a, a duplex and to a non-owner occupied duplex. Right. Okay. Well, Mr. Chair, actually, the use classification that Ms. White's going for is um, converted dwelling. Oh, that's which right. doesn't really have 
So duplexes have two different types of use categories. So one is an owner-occupied duplex, which is a separate use category from non-owner-occupied duplex. Converted dwelling could be either or. And usually if it's a non-owner-occupied converted dwelling, you have to have a resident manager on site, which according to the materials submitted, um, there is a lease addendum language on resident manager towards the end of, of the lease agreement that was submitted as part of the application. And if it's an owner-occupied converted dwelling, there has to be the owner living in one of the units at all times. So that's that's pretty much the use, just to clarify that better for the board. So if this is approved, um, the existing, the owner is an occupant for the time being and satisfies that requirement. And upon sale, they'd have to either come, come up with a, a management company or a residential manager or owner-occupant, if that's what it was sold as, as that. Correct. So yes. it wouldn't require any, any change in currently, but it would be it could require a change upon sale. And if it does, the board could condition with other converted dwellings that change in ownership would require you know meeting with the building commissioner and then significant changes, so on public hearing with the board. Okay. Um, do people have any questions? Any board members have questions? Mr. White. Uh, Ms. White, that's weird. Uh, no. <laughs> so from what I'm seeing, am I correct in seeing that you have across the street from you, uh, I believe it's the sorority Chi Omega? No. That was my only question. <clears throat> Other questions? If not, there are no questions. Um, we'd open it up for public comment. So I'm not seeing any hands raised, Mr. Chair. Just a reminder oh, to we got open. one. There is one. All right. Uh, we'll promote, allow for Sarah to talk. Sarah, when you come on, can you um, just Give us your name and address. Um, address your comments to the board. I'll give you about three minutes. I'll try to keep track of it here. Um, yes. Right. Can you hear me? Yep, I can. You may okay. proceed. Name and address, please. I'm uh, Sarah Brayman at 396 Middle Street in Amherst. Um, and I, I didn't know if there was going to be... Um, uh, time for comment after you all discuss. So I just wanted to jump in. I I lived. Um, I'm I'm Priscilla's daughter, and I did live at the property for ten years. For the first ten years, we were there. I think it was 2003 to 2013. Um, and I guess I just just real briefly, I want to um, concur <laughs> with be you know watching the the nature of that neighborhood change. Um, and add in that, you know, during that time, um, my mom worked pretty hard on trying to maintain the spirit of the neighborhood with the town. And, and that that's not the way things fell out. Um, the, you know, the, the university developed around us there. Um, and, you know, I, it, it it makes sense. It's so close to close close to UMass that this, I guess, would happen. But I guess I guess my point is, I just in in case there's not time for discussion later, it you know, and we 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 talked a lot about whether to, you know, um, you know, mom was talking a lot about whether to you know go for this change. And I think one of the things that came up for me thinking about it is, it's really. Um, it's kind of it's just disingenuous to sell this property at this point as an owner occupied property. I mean, you could if you wanted to, you know, put it on the market in the summer and sell it to some unsuspecting person who may be on a quiet, you know, quiet week in 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 late July doesn't understand what they're buying into. But it's that you know that's not the kind of thing that any any one of I think anyone here would want to would want to do to somebody it has been um I mean it's turned into just such a stress and um 
you know, when the building was happening, such a, you know, even a health hazard of the trucks going back and forth and back and forth, building that huge, huge um, dorm for almost, you know, I think it was over a year. So I, you know, I, I'm just trying to paint the picture with a little more detail. Um, and certainly I've had close experience living there and, you know, visiting there obviously pretty regularly off and on for the 10 years that we've been living on the other side of town. Um, but I just hope that the, the board can kind of, you know, take into context um, the, uh, yeah, just sort of the, 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 the you know, the, a, a fairness here. Um, to to a person who's lived in the town and and worked pretty hard to for the betterment of the town um, and is just at this point having to give up. So um, I don't know if if no one has any questions. That's all. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Is, are there any other comments from the public? I see a hand raise from a Phil, and forgive me if I mispronounce name, Phil, Phil Grauer. So I'm going to give him speaking permissions. Mr. Grauer, can you uh, state your name and address for the record, please? And keep Hi, can, can you hear me now? Yep. yep. Oh, great. Uh, my name is Philip Grauer. I'm Sarah Brayman's husband, and I am Priscilla's son-in-law. And I live at 396 Middle Street in Amherst. And uh, I'm right now at the Muller Center, so it's a little noisy. Um, but I, I just want to add that uh, the, 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 the nature of the neighborhood uh, on Lincoln Avenue, where Scylla owns this house, has changed very dramatically in the last 20 years. And I, I am completely in agreement with Sarah that I think it would be disingenuous to, to, to keep the house in, in, in the in the, in the state of occupancy that it is for a resale because I think it would be uh, very detrimental to uh, whoever moves in there and would would be occupying that house. Uh, I think it's just that the, the the conditions of that neighborhood are such that the property re really is uh, is part uh, uh, now of a community, a student community attached to the uh, the UMass campus, and um, I don't think that pendulum is going to swing back. And uh, it, it definitely changed the nature of uh, Priscilla's living conditions uh, over the last twenty years, and in particular over the last five years. And I think it, uh, I think it's something that this board should uh, take take very seriously. And uh, uh, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Grower. Any more comments from the public? I am not seeing any other additional hands raised, Mr. Chair. Um, That's it, I think. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, I, I can't imagine that you want to um, rebut anything that your daughter and son-in-law have said, Ms. White, but. This is a chance to comment on for the commenters for you, if you wish, or to add something to their comments. I mean, that, that's perfectly appropriate as well. No, I'm fine. All right. Does, does anybody on the board have a comment or a question before we go to the public meeting portion? Mr. Sloviter. Um, yes, I have a comment. I was, after reading all of the information in the packet and reading Mr. Spiegel's letter and given my feeling about preserving the character of the town as best we can, I was fully prepared to oppose this. I am persuaded that that would be very unfair and inappropriate given that this block is not at the tipping point. It is way past the tipping point. This block is a disaster. It is, it should be viewed as a 
shame on what has happened to Amherst in certain neighborhoods. I admire Priscilla White for holding out and being the stalwart for the neighborhood in the town that she has been. And I am, you know, I, she and the letter from Mr. Spiegel actually make my case for me in terms of the other property that we discussed today and the effect of neighborhoods tipping drastically towards student housing. Mr. Spiegel's uh, letter clearly stated that Priscilla White has been a wonderful neighbor and a pleasure to be near, but that every, every other condition in the neighborhood has deteriorated. So I am in great sympathy with her and her situation. And my mind has been changed by the realization that this neighborhood is already lost and is definitely, as her son-in-law said, I think he I think he was very diplomatic and said something like not likely is the, the pendulum is not likely to swing back. I'm going to be dead for a hundred years before this pendulum makes any movement back. So I agree completely with the case that they have made and Whereas I entered this meeting tonight ready to oppose it, I support the fairness in her not being penalized for having made such a noble effort to hold out for the betterment of the town and the neighborhood. So in, in case any of the rest of the board was worried that I was going to make another stand and oppose non-owner occupied, um, I, I can't do it to her. I think she has been exemplary in her conduct and I support this. Other comments from the board? If not, oh, Mr. White. Um, just real quick. Uh, I'd like to actually echo, uh, what Mr. Sloviter was saying. Um, upon looking at this, just glancing at it from what I'm seeing, only four of the 14 properties on this kind of block are actually owner occupied. Um, I think it's kind of past a point now where there can be a reasonable assumption for, you know, what Miss White's looking for. Um, and I did drive by the property yesterday and yeah, with those apartments, storms, whatever they are right there at UMass, they're right across, I mean, essentially right across the street. And that was also why I asked the question about the sorority uh, being across the street from her as well. Um, yeah, I came into this uh, thinking that it was in all likelihood I would oppose it, but I can't in good conscience or conscience, I believe, do that any longer. If there are no additional comments, I would entertain, I would, we will move uh, to the public meeting while keeping the public hearing open in case you need to gather more additional information. The public meeting portion is generally where the board deliberates. We've had some of that already, and it's not generally, not normally a time for a public comment. This is a chance to give your views on the, on the, the application before us. And uh, I think we've heard from two people. I, I'm in the same position. I'll give you my first overview. Um, this is one of those neighborhoods where it's happened. And it's not that I think it, it, it's a natural occurrence that you're that close to the school, that close to the university. All these properties are student rental, except for the four. There's some owner occupied buildings. There's some two family residences. Um, one of those, one of those that I see nearby in the immediate block, only one of those is owner occupied. Um, it's mostly single family houses in the area, mostly non-owner occupied. I think the neighborhood has turned over into um, a student housing and I can't imagine that we would um, tell somebody who's lived there for a long time that they can't sell the house as everybody else has done in the past in that neighborhood. So um, I'm prepared to support this.
So, um, if other comments, we have some questions. We have some. If there are, yes, Mr. Mr. Henry, I saw your hand up. So, just want to understand um, if Miss White sells the property, would we ask the buyers? To come back before and get a different special permit or is are we going to allow just change the use and it passes with the sale of the property permit the special permit passes with the sale of the property okay but also when, but but there is a yeah. but we tend in a converted dwelling we mm -hmm. ask the new owners or the prospective owners to come back in case there's a need to review conditions on that property. And so there's a chance for the board to say, you know, the we notice that there's X, Y, and Z that has caused problems in the past or was a concern, whatever it was. Not in this case, I don't see that. But there is a but in an under converted property, there's a chance for the board to look at it if it's um, uh, upon sale. And also, Mr. Chairman, I want to add that um, under proposed condition two. Um, it actually talks about change of ownership must meet with the building commissioner to determine if further review is needed by the board. Um, and that will promulgate whether or not it has to come back before a public meeting or if it's significant enough, it has to go back to the public hearing portion. And so usually that would, so say if she were to sell and the new owner wants to do non-owner occupied, they would have to meet with the board at a public meeting or if it's completely changing the application and management plan, they'll have to modify the permit. It just depends on the situation. So the short answer, Mr. Henry, is that we're, the board, the building commissioner and the board get a, 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 a chance to review this if need be. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right, Rob, um, we need to make a waiver, I think for us, a, a waiver on but we don't need to make a waiver on parking. What? Uh, let me just take a there, quick look. Are there, any, are there any conditions that we need to have that are not in your possible, uh, proposed 14 conditions Something that we discussed? Uh, so I guess you can ignore proposed condition number, sorry, conditions the board should discuss number one regarding owner occupancy because the board okay. Is an agreement that the neighborhoods change a lot. So um, I, I can take number one. Um, board. Well, it, it, the board doesn't have to. The board doesn't have to submit a condition that it, if it becomes not owner occupied, that there is a resident manager or the there's already conditions in the zoning bylaw, isn't there? Not yeah. for so I, we don't need number two. No, and number no. three, the board should discuss how many occupants are allowed in each unit. Um, is that specified here in the, I think, um, so, um, four and one. Mm -hmm. And are these occupants, again, if it's a, if it would be a family, it'd be a not, un, these would be unrelated occupants, right? Yes, that's correct. So if so you we, want to we add. Want to adjust that. If you want to add number three as a condition, it would have to be front unit has four unrelated individuals and one person in the back, unless the board wants to allow for more than one person in the back, up to you. Um, no, I mean, I, that back unit only has one bedroom, so I don't know what the board's feeling about small. that. Yeah. I don't, you're not seeking to change the, Ms. White, you're not seeking to change the number of people to live in the in the back unit, The eight, what, what is now an ADU? It's appropriate for one person, right? It's either appropriate for one person or a couple. A couple? It's, it's uh, yeah, it's a, it's a 640 square foot oh. spacious, <laughs> one of the spacious apartment. And when my daughter moved out 10 years ago, we rented to a number of UMass couples. All right. So, so, all right. So, so then, let's, Rob, let's, let's, change that to uh, um, no more than four unrelated occupants in the front and no more than two unrelated occupants in the back. Does that make sense? You agree with that, Ms. White? Yes. Okay. Makes sense. 
All right. So the conditions that we've that are before us, the standard conditions are got to be comply with the plans that are submitted. Um, the ownership were to change, and the owner must meet with the building commissioner. We discussed that um, ZBA earlier. But this is what we're trying to do often now is to is to nullify pre old Z, uh, special permits so that it's clean going forward. We would do that on the 2006 2000. 14 special permits. The floor should, the rooms have to be used as labeled. The management plan should be followed. Any changes comes to back to the board at a public meeting. Lighting shall be uh, shielded or downcast. Lighting fixtures are dock correct compliance regarding our rules. Two dwelling units shall be assigned a number to unit and with signs depicting the unit clearly visible. So you'll need to have well numbers that can be seen so that would be once this permit goes and if this gets approved you need to do a, a better job of having your units um the signage being obvious and seen okay parking shall occur on approved services only is maintained um I, I think you comply with seven we'll go back to that already i don't think there's any changes there you've got a, the property shall register with the residential rental program and um, you have to file an annual report on complaints of log violation. Again, that's a standard provision for rental properties. Parking areas should be des uh, designed in conformance with the article, with article 8 of zoning bylaw. The trash receptacles are already screened from the public right away. Existing plant screening shall be maintained on the northerly side of the driveway and um, additional planning from time to time to maintain screening at ground level for your neighbor, your abutters, and the gravel driveway shall be maintained, be maintained seasonally or more often if needed to prevent ruts and or vegetation within the gravel area and to maintain a distinct edge between the gravel and any lawn or landscaped area. And the reason for that is that you're not uh, allowed Mr. to park. Mr. Lawn. Chair, actually, so, um, I, I might have put that one there in error. They actually have a paved driveway. So I guess we can propose to remove condition, uh, I believe it's 14. Wasn't there, I think there are railroad ties there. Is that is it the railroad ties that are then Am I confusing this with someplace else we've been to? There's not there's not a wooden tie there. Okay, I thought there was. Yeah, the tape about a year ago. Oh. So we'll remove fourteen, right? Yeah, yeah, we'll remove fourteen. Sorry about that. Okay. And then you All proposed right. adding a condition, so possible condition number three, but changing it to be no more than four unrelated occupants in the front unit, and then no more than two unrelated occupants in the back. Correct. Okay, now the condition 15. Are there suggestions for other con conditions from the members? I just want to be clear. Are we removing possible one and two? Both no. of them? Oh, yeah, are the possible one and two are gone, correct. Yeah, yes. okay, thank you. The possible one and the con should consider one and twos are gone. Mm -hmm. And three becomes 14. All right. Um, if there's no discussion about conditions, I'd like to um, approve them in block. Do I have a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the conditions in block. All in favor say aye. Or no, excuse me. <laughs> Someday we'll get to that, but we're just going to do, we're going to do roll call votes. Darn it. Um, Vote occurs on the motion to approve the conditions in block. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Bloviter? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. All right, the conditions are approved in block. Now we have to make our findings under 10.38. I Help me, Rob, do, I have to, do we have to make any fi <clears throat> other findings or are there any waivers that we need? before we get to 10.38? Yeah, sure. So you have to make um, two findings. So the first one is that um, you have to make a finding for condition eight under section 3.3241, yep. uh, which um, in this case, you're essentially approving that this project's eligible to be a converted dwelling, um, that it doesn't involve any uh, 
demolition or removal of existing structure or reconstruction that exceeds 20% of the gross square footage. In this case, it's clear that nothing's happening, so it doesn't really exceed that threshold. Then you also have to make a 9.22 finding because I believe the the lot itself is non-conforming because of area and frontage. Um, so the lot doesn't have the sufficient square footage, I believe, for two units, but it does. It is pre-existing non-conforming, so the board just has to uh, make the finding that it's not detrimental to the neighborhood for them to change the use to a converted dwelling with with two units. So those are the two additionals you have to do on top of ten point three eight. That's right. Thank you, Rob. Mm -hmm. So I. I'm prepared to move. I'm prepared to accept the motion on 3.3241 that it does meet with the requirements of the converted dwelling and section 9.22 dealing with non conforming uses and structures, and that it does not provide, uh, it's not detrimental to the neighborhood. Unless there's any objections, I'll proceed on to the other and we'll vote all these uh, findings and block. Um, 10.380 and 381 is in the residential district, which has several rental properties in the neighborhood. It seems that it's not, it's suitably located in the neighborhood. 10.382, 383, 385, and 387 deal with um, nuisance and dust and vibration and lights and offensive uh, um, odors and structures. Um, I think the, we're not proposing any, no, there's no change proposed in the physical structure of the building. I think that condition, those findings can be made. 10.384, adequate and appropriate facilities can be provided for proper operation and use. They currently have it. 10.386 deals with parking signs and regulations. Parking is in conformance with Article 7 of the bylaws. 10.387 provides convenient, safe vehicular traffic. Um, does not, we don't believe that it provides any um, issues to, vehicular and pedestrian traffic and, or movement on the site. 10.388 uh, does not apply, deals with off-street loading and of vehicles. 10.389 provides a uh, method of disposal or storage of refuse. Um, the applicant would be doing the trash removal themselves. I guess we didn't discuss that. Um, but mm -hmm. you're, you're currently doing this trash removal yourself and you're going to continue to do that? We, we uh, yeah, we are three um, grandmothers now in the house. We generate very little trash. We have a composter for okay. all of our vegetables and we, we have a very complete recycling. So we take a blue bag every week or two to uh, the transfer station. Got it. So that doesn't mean that, but if the property sells, and there's this, this would be a reason, Mr. Henry, that we might have a meeting with the uh, the new owners is that we would want them to have trash uh, pickup or at least a plan for pickup. We'd want to discuss it with them. You may not have the same uh, trash demands. So um, I think we can say that you meet currently meet the requirements of 10.389. 390 um, deals with flood, doesn't apply. 10.391 does not apply. Historic buildings 10.392. Um, the proposal of adequate landscaping, the height of the fence in the rear of the driveway, the applicant. Um, you have, if I remember correctly, we walked in the back and it, it gets substantial screening to your neighbors in the back. Yeah, we have a six foot fence and we have um, shrubs, and across the fence are um, two uh, oak trees. Right. So I think there's, I, I, on the site visit, I thought there was sufficient screening for the property. 10.393, um, we discussed you're going to, any new lighting would be dark sky compliance. And 10.394, um, that does not, it's flat, it's not very applicable. 10.395 does not create disharmony with respect to terrain, this does not apply. 10.396 provides screening for storage areas. Um, you, have, you don't have trash receptacles, so um, you've got a um, compost pile or composter. That, I think you meet the requirements of that. 3.97, adequate green space for tenants to enjoy. And 10.398 deals with 
generally is the proposal is in harmony with the general purpose and intent of the bylaw and the goals of the master plan. And I think we could, I would say we could find that as well. So um, the question before the board is, do, will we approve those findings and block on 3.3241, I think it is, and 9.22, as well as all under 10.38. Do I have a motion to, do those, to approve those in block? We're getting shy here, guys. Okay, <laughs> we got one. Do we have a second? second? All right, we got a second. Is there any discussion on the motion to approve the, the findings and block? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to approve the findings. The chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Marshall? Aye. All right. Um, so we approved the conditions, we've approved the findings. The last thing to do is to move to approve the special permit application and close the public hearing on special permit application FY2024-06. That's one and two. No, yeah, two, is it, yeah, that's zero six, correct? Yep. Uh, we got one little, we got a little mistake there on the, Rob, on the application. With, we got a zero one up there, and you mean zero six. Okay, yeah, I could change that. So, and, it's, and, to, and then I'd say to permit the staff to make any technical conforming changes from our discussion tonight, including that one. Um, any, dis, any discussion on the motion to approve this application and close the public hearing. If not, the, uh, the vote occurs on the motion. Chair votes aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Ms. Marshall? Aye. Vote is five to nothing. The special permit is approved. Congratulations, Ms. White. Good luck. Thank you. Welcome. And um, just, you know, general spiel that I always give. So um, we're going to render the decision document, Priscilla. Um, that'll take about maybe a week or two. Um, once that's rendered, the board members have to sign off on it. And once they sign off on it, we file the decision with the town clerk. And once it's filed with the town clerk, there is a 20-day window appeal period that starts. Um, during that 20-day appeal period, any member or grief party from the public can appeal the decision of the board to a higher court, superior court, land court. Um and after that 20-day appeal period, you have to get a true copy attest of the special permit decision from the town clerk's office. And um, you have to get their certification of no appeal during the 20-day appeal period. Then after you get all that information, all those documents, you file it with the Hampshire County Registry of Deeds and the special permit becomes effective. Um, of course, I'll send a cover letter with, your, with a copy, unofficial copy of your decision document um, that outlines all these steps and um, you know, if there's any questions you have for us for the time being, you can ask now. You can always follow up with me later. Um, but I guess, rhetorically, do you have any questions for us, or um, is it pretty much uh, clear what's happening next? Are you asking me? Yeah, I'm asking you. Sorry. <laughs> okay, I just um, so I the language is a little bit beyond me, but mm -hmm. I think the the converted dwelling part is is has been agreed to and the non-owner occupied part is also agreed to is that yes. right yes so the non-owner occupied part is for when if you were to sell and the prospective buyer wants to make a non-owner occupied complex they have to meet with the town first to make sure there's going to be no significant changes and then they have to deal with their own processes of coming back to the board okay okay yep. So you're allowed to continue living there as an owner-occupied premise for the time being. Right. And you're allowed to sell it as two units. Yep. Sell it as two units. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for your hard work. Of course. Time to go home. <laughs> <laughs> this is our Thursday nights. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Ms. White. Good luck. Thank you. Um, Next order of business is public comment on any matter not before the board tonight. I see no hands raised. Do you, Rob? I do not, Mr. Chair. I think we didn't intend to, but we may have waited everybody out or exhausted them. Probably. 
Um, the last thing would be our schedule. Uh, the last thing is old business, and this I would raise the schedule, Rob, if you could tell us what's going on. I know we got a couple of weeks off. Yes, uh, which is nice because I've yeah. had a meeting every every Thursday for the past month and a half now. Um, yeah. So uh, the next meeting for the Valley CDC 40V project would be on November 30th. And then after that, December 14th, we have an anticipated one or two permit hearings for that normal scheduled dates. And then the week after that, I'm not sure which December date, I think it's the 21st. Um, there is another Valley CDC uh, public hearing as well. And then um, we have a normally scheduled meeting after that uh, before the holidays, which has nothing scheduled for a moment. So that's, that's our schedule coming up, Mr. Chair. Uh, it's getting pretty light, which is good. So that normal this time of year. Yeah. And then we'll crash back into it in January. Where we'll have yep. both solar and and valley. Uh those are two big things. Okay. Absolutely. And I'd open it up to anybody on the board for any comments or questions or anything else, any new business. I just have to say that this was um, um a meeting that I think where a lot of issues were raised that um really tested the board and it's um, on, t on tough things. And I think it was all handled. I want to compliment all of you. I think you did a really good job of stating your case, looking at the, the uh, requirements and the responsibilities that we have and trying to figure out what is the right thing to do given the, within the framework of the bylaw. And that doesn't mean we always agree on all of it. But I think everybody gave a, a had a heartfelt and strong representation of their views, and I think everybody tried to stay within their responsibility in the, of the within the bylaw and using and, it's, and using their discretion. And so I, I applaud all of you and thank the staff for their work. And I appreciate what you do. So thank you and good night. I would have I would entertain a motion entertain a motion to adjourn. <laughs> Happily so, moved. <laughs> <laughs> I, do I hear a happy second? I, I second. All right. In it, in spite of your slightly early good night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you know you I, were sometimes eager. that happens. Sometimes good night, I, but I need a motion. Right. Okay. <laughs> I, I'll never get to sleep unless we have this motion. So. Unless we have this motion. Right. Let's well, do you'll it. You have your motion and your second. <laughs> I would. We'd have to all come back in. That would be awful. All right. Since this is not debatable, that's not what we were doing. Uh, the motion before us is to adjourn. The chair votes aye. Mr. Henry. Aye. Mr. White. Aye. Mr. Sloboder. I vote aye for good night. <laughs> <laughs> and Miss Marshall. Aye, but I want to know the dog's name. Oh, this is Daphne. Daphne. Right. <laughs> Daphne. There's another yeah. one on the floor named Tony. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Tony. Same breed. <laughs>